questions or comments, all in favor of adopting the agenda? Carry. thanks very much. And the next part is a public participation, and it turns out tonight we're okay? All right, we, we thought we had somebody wish to speak, but that's changed. Um, and the presentations and delegations, and there's a number of them tonight, so uh, we're going to ask for your tolerance tonight in uh, getting through these, because otherwise the people that are towards the end will be sitting here at 10 o'clock and, and uh, nobody will be watching. So um, stick, try and stick to your time if you can, please. That'll be really important. So you're going to have um, an opportunity to start your presentations. And the first one up is the Cultural Development Committee. And it says you start at 7.05, <laughs> and I think it's 7.02, so you're ahead already. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm just going to try to start our presentation here. So, Joy, if you don't mind, we all know you and love you, but uh, those of you that are presenting, just make sure you introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Um, my name is Joy Barrett, and I'm the Cultural Development Officer for the City of Nelson. And my name is Sydney Black, and I'm the chair of the Cultural Development Committee, and I'll be presenting with Joy as well this evening. Great. Now, do you does everybody see my see the PowerPoint? Okay, it's hard to tell from my end. Yep. See, see it here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. Great. We're good to go. Okay. So, 2021 continued to be an unusual time for us all. But despite this, the city's cultural development committee was able to move forward with both our regular and new initiatives, always working to further arts, culture and heritage support and development in Nelson. Our art <coughs> rental program, which is an important financial support for local artists, was able to continue, as was our ongoing downtown sculpture partnership with Castlegar Sculpture Walk while the downtown murals led by the Nelson and District Arts Council continued to brighten our city. We also received funding from Nelson Hydro to cover the utility boxes at the entrance to the rec complex, highlighting historical community sports figures, an idea brought to us from the community. The city and the CDC's recognition programs have become an important way to recognize and reward our outstanding creative talent, and this past year's recipients demonstrate that. Author Jane Byers, who will be publishing and touring with her new book this year, was announced as our 2022 Cultural Ambassador, and Nelson Cares Society was recognized for the remarkable work they've done restoring Ward Street Place. These programs, along with the grant provided or the grant support provided via the Community Initiatives Funds and administered through the CDC, further established Nelson's reputation near and far as an arts and culture destination which fosters and rewards creativity. So community partnerships and collaborations are incredibly important to the arts and culture sector, and we've strengthened these ties through shared projects which are beneficial to us all. The Nelson and District Arts Council, in partnership with Community Futures and the CDC, spearheaded a revised economic impact of the arts report, which is currently in its final stages and will come to City Council shortly for review. This report, completed by Selkirk College in collaboration with the Economic Impact Working Group, which includes members of the CDC and the local arts and business community, measures the sector's growth and achievements, increasing awareness of the sector's economic impact in political and business spheres and the general populations, and providing a strong basis for leveraging grants and other funding. We've also recently partnered with Selkirk College to submit a grant application to the Federal Time Immemorial Program. This project seeks to build an outdoor Indigenous cultural arbor on the Selkirk Nelson campus, a central focus for community events, celebrations, performances, and learning related to Indigenous history, education, truth, justice, and reconciliation. The space will be accessible to the community members and will allow for deep and meaningful engagement with the topic of truth and reconciliation in a public space that has had marginal Indigenous recognition and interpretation up to this point. Additionally, our partnership with the National Economise organization has made great progress, adding two more local artisans to the program and increasing the visibility of Nelson's artisan community throughout the province and country. Since adding grant writing to the Cultural Development Officer's portfolio in 2019, we have brought in over a million dollars in project funding to the city. 
We recently applied for and received $204,000 in funding for Cottonwood Park through the CBT's Outdoor Revitalization Fund. Working closely with the Nelson Farmers Market Advisory Committee, the Nelson Izushi Friendship Society, and the City's Development Services Department, this project will greatly enhance the community space, adding shade sales for the market and community events, seasonal lighting through the park, um, and enabling winter markets. We'll also be creating disability access to the falls building and installing a garden shed for use up by the Izushi Society, replacing cement barriers with decorative planters, installing bear-proof garbage bins, and commissioning an artistic infill for the soon-to-be um, to, 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 for the soon-to-be installed safety railing on the west side of the falls. Additionally, the three buildings around the park, Cottonwood Auto Bar Body, the Nelson Leafs Depot, and the Rod and Gun Club will also receive matching grants of up to $5,000 for exterior improvements to their own businesses. In 2022, we will continue to work closely with the planning and public works on art and infrastructure and public art initiatives throughout the city, in particular seeking funding to further the proposed initiatives to Nelson Civic Center, a cultural structure vital to our community and the many organizations it currently houses. With COVID continuing, it's more important than ever that the CDC and the city continue to find every way we can to support our local arts, culture and heritage institutions, which continue to face ongoing closures, restrictions and reduced revenues. Without this, the foundations which decades of community work have built could crumble. So we are very near completion on the city's first heritage master plan, which was funded by Heritage BC and the Columbia Basin Trust and written by the renowned Vancouver based heritage consultant Denise Cook in collaboration with the city's heritage working group. We hope to present this to Council in the next two months. This document sets out strategies and actions to recognize and conserve Nelson's cultural and built heritage and ensure they align with the vision and work plan of Nelson's OCP, something that is more important and timely than ever, given the increasing development that Nelson is now seeing. A significant part of this plan is the completion of over 100 statements of significance for historical buildings originally identified in Nelson's Heritage Register back in 1994. We've completed over 69 this past year alone, which is remarkable progress considering we were only completing one or two a year prior to this grant. The completion and adoption of the master plan and statements is the number one priority for the Heritage Working Group, and we'll be looking for additional grant sources to digitize all our results, making them easily accessible by the community. Additionally, we'll continue our work with community-based groups, including Mount St. Francis Advocacy Group, who are documenting this building through photos, films, and a book. In terms of our budget request, um, it's pretty minimal because in the past, we did actually apply for matching funding through the, the, the grant program, which now allowed us to do the Heritage Master Plan. So that has already been taken care of. So really it's mostly just the heritage award and some minimal expenses as you see here with a total budget request of 1750. And over to Sid. We'll move over to the CDC budget request. So the request from the city is for $60,900, $60, which is the same levels as our ask from 2020 and includes contract employment and the ambassador program as well. Great, and that's our presentation for tonight. I can quit out of the program here. Okay, um, questions? Thank you, Joanne. And, um, so questions, yes. And Sydney, you're, you're so either to you or, or Sydney Keith, or Joy. I think I saw matter, your hand right? and then, yep. Okay. Uh, so we have, a, I see a couple of hands up here. So I'll start with Nicole uh, Charwood. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, oh, so obviously <laughs> you've laid out a wonderful year of accomplishments uh, besides COVID and a lot of great yeah. stuff around town and, and a lot of great stuff into the future. Um, one of the conversations that I wanted to highlight was the priority of the Civic Center 
uh, and some of the conversations that council has had around that and the communities had around uh, understanding where these facilities uh, will be going into the future. And one of those conversations in council have heard me speak to this in the past, uh, or at least some of that voice I've been bringing back from the CDC is that need to bring uh, a strategic or lay down a strategic uh, master plan for our arts and culture institutions. And so I'm wondering, uh, as we go into 2022 and we get the economic development, uh, what do you said? Someone help me with the name of the report coming off that we'll be getting another opportunity to uh, hear more about what happened with the uh, the creative workforce in our community over the last COVID times. Uh, is how we want to go ahead and create a master plan for where our creative community is going so that when facilities are coming up for opportunities, we have more clarity as a community as to what they will be used for uh, that will, you know, alleviate some of the concerns sometimes and let us really set ourselves up for the next 25 years or 50 years as it may be. So there's a lot there, but I will let you two make no. the most of it. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just briefly speak and then hand it over to Sid. I, I think that's really important. I mean, we're lucky at the CDC that we have voices from a lot of the kind of main community groups in the city. So each month we're hearing from everybody, you know, about what their priorities are and also as a community where we need to go. So I think getting that down on paper and definitely working with all our CD CDC members to kind of work out that plan is super important. And we've been really, really fortunate to have received the funding that we did to create the Heritage Master Plan. And so I think that that's also something that we would want to look into to ensure that there's a, a substantial amount of money to make sure that we can can do this properly. But I think it's a really fantastic idea to, to see where we're going and have a really clear view of that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Charlwood, I think you had your hand up at one point. Yeah, I thought I was third, but... Um, yeah, it's hard to see because I, I don't see all... Okay, now I see all of council. Sorry if I'm bumping somebody. No, that's um, fine. Thank you for um, just highlighting all of the amazing work you guys are doing. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, your role in <clears throat> helping us connect to, um, you know, our path of first truth-telling and you know, we know that that's still a big piece of what's going on with our colonial connections, especially through our institutions. And so I really um, am grateful for the work through the various organizations that meet at your table. I hope you'll share that, you know, council, I anyway, am grateful for the work they're doing in our community and helping to educate city staff included in that, which is sort of our current uh, call to um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, recommendations for local governments. So thank you for that work. And I have a question. Um, I am wondering about how council could get, uh, perhaps given how much online work we do, we'd love to bring some artists to our table to say hello. Do you guys see organizing that for us? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely in the past, we did these cultural, these monthly cultural presentations pre -COVID that were, of course, like in person. But if you are up for it, absolutely, we could, we could, you know, do that online for sure. And yeah, what you were speaking about previously, I definitely when I was working on the grant application for the time immemorial, it was a real learning process for me. And I'd like to thank uh, Sid for help on that. But also Stephanie Fisher, who has done just an <coughs> immense amount of work. Um, in the community and she was just super helpful in in guiding me and helping me with that too so thanks Steph I see you there and she's I can't think of anybody in the community who's really put in more hours than you on that thank you um, so up next Dude, I didn't see a hand from anybody Jesse else was. so I'm not sure Cal, Cal, uh, Cal has his hand now Okay, Jesse, uh, Councillor Renwick, and then and then uh, Councillor Woodward, and then Kevin Corman. Thank you, Mayor uh, Joy Sydney. Thank you very much for the great presentation, and and thank you for the continued uh, fantastic work you guys do. Um, 
wow, it, 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 so you see a presentation like that and you just, uh, you know, you forget about some of those things and especially with the COVID and what's happened, but, you know, good on you guys. Um, I don't know if you saw the article in the Nelson Star, I believe it was online, but with what's going on down at the streetcar and I've had some chats with the guys down there and just throwing this out to you, if they needed some help with grant writing or whatever, is that something that we can look to you guys for, for some help? I, I think I'm in a meeting Monday about that. <laughs> me, me too. So yeah, we will we will lead them to where they will be able to drink from the grant fountain. So we're definitely uh, gearing up to to help direct them into places where they can can source out funding. Sure. Well, if there's anybody that knows more about the fountain, it's you guys. So thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Unwick. Councillor Woodward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, just on a it, it's not a question it's just a comment talking about the the mural festival and and all of the beautiful art around town. And I have to say, uh, just for a mental health um, from a mental health perspective, I, I do find walking around my family, looking up at those murals. It has been in this time of COVID where everyone's under a lot of stress. It's been really wonderful, and I love how the mural festival is can operate within the COVID boundaries and still create this beautiful public art. So I just wanna thank you all who are involved um, in, in having that beautiful colors and the visions still within these tough times. So thank you both for that work. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks, Sid, <laughs> the mural festival. Yeah. Kevin? Yeah, no, I echo all those things. It's, you know, it's amazing work that all of you do. Um, the one piece that we seem to not necessarily keep track as the cultural collaborative work that we did. And, and that's, I guess, a, I have some concern when you know, we do do that work and and we don't seem to advance it. So, um, you know, I just think a commitment by everyone if we're gonna do some additional planning work, but, you know, there's a commitment to advance that. Um, you know, that was the idea and thought with the cultural collaboration work. and. It, and it's, you know, I don't think it's a lack of anybody's good faith. It's just everybody gets so busy in their own own piece of the puzzle. It's hard to you know, really advance some of those those things. So just a reminder of how we, you know, how we, you know, because I think we all do some really good planning work and we just need to create the space that we can actually follow through on some of those things. And we have our planning session in the next month or so. And so, um, and actually it might almost be time to get a working group to kind of revisit that collaboration document and see where it came from and where we are at currently. So that's definitely something we can talk about putting into our into our planning session and kind of reviewing that with a working group just to make sure that it's still it's still on point and is still, you know, flowing with where we are at as a as a community. But that's a that's a great idea. Thanks very much, Kevin. For your question. Any further questions? Uh, I don't see any more. So thank you both very much for your presentation. And we have we have four in a row here from the cultural community. And you know, when I looked at this when we first got the agenda, I thought, you know, how fortunate we are to have people that have kept that sort of vision alive through COVID. Many communities haven't had that sort of foundation to work from. And I think coming out the other end, we'll be in better shape to move forward with much of what's been proposed by each one of these groups tonight. So thank you both very much. I know you've got many hats and and uh, I'd be surprised if you don't show up here later on at some point, either, to be honest with you. So thanks very much. We'll Great. move on to the next one. Thank you. Uh, Nelson, Nelson District Arts Council. Here we go, another hat. <laughs> here we go. Let me see if I can share this. Let's see. Yeah. And. Is that looking good? There you go. Got the curtains open. Excellent. Woohoo. So, good evening, Mayor Dooley, councillors, and staff. I'd like you to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Sydney Black, and I am the Executive Director of the Nelson and District Arts Council. So, we were founded in 1969, and we currently have eight dedicated volunteer board members. We employ one three quarter time executive director, uh, one new administration assistant who's with us for 10 hours a week, which is really exciting, four summer students, 
13 event contractors and over 150 artists who this year were paid out over $268,000 in wages and fees. We continue to focus on three pillars of support, showcasing opportunities like Art Walk and the Mural Festival, providing educational opportunities, and working with the regional, provincial, and federal governments to ensure that the needs of local artists and arts organizations are met. So we always want to know why should we get money from you, uh, mostly because of the three things listed here. We support the city's path to 2040 principles. We support the local economy through artist support and presentation, and have recently been named as the Secretary Representative for Arts and Culture on the Nelson Area Economic Development Partnership, uh, because we create important programming that engages our community, and oh, there's four points, because we require support from our municipality in order for other fund funders to see us as a viable entity. So a little bit about our programming this past year. We held our fourth annual Nelson International Mural Festival. And despite COVID, we had a very successful festival. Unfortunately, mural creation is a solitary activity, so we were able to continue forward. We were incredibly encouraged by the business community's support despite the challenging times, and we're delighted to have private wall owners who stepped up to support NDAC's beautification of the downtown core. We created nine pieces this year from artists across Canada. And while murals were able to continue on in a regular fashion, our music and workshop portion of the festival had to be fully rethought again. Initially, we were hosting smaller patio parties this year, but due to a large community COVID outbreak the week of the festival, we went from something that wouldn't have totally been like this, but in my mind, it would have been like this, to this again yay so our amazing team was able to pull our full festival online we streamed over 25 hours of content including eight amazing workshops and again had over 10,000 unique viewers over the festival weekend every individual that was involved showed their true resilience as we made this large change uh, which at the last minute was a little bit hectic i think we cancelled two days before and we're still able to have all of the in-person performers uh, pull their performances online uh, we were also very lucky that we had pre-recorded a lot of our festival weekend performances which allowed us to engage videographers film editors and sound designers in both nelson and vancouver all while abiding by the provincial health officer rules and regulations as Joy mentioned, uh, we co-developed a study entitled The Economic Conditions of the Nelson and Area Arts, Culture and Heritage Sector with the Nelson and Area Economic Development Partnership, the Cultural Development Committee, Development Committee and its Economic Working Group, and Selkirk College. The three main areas of focus of the study are to understand the impact of COVID on arts, culture and heritage sector, to describe the size of the arts, culture and heritage, se heritage sector and its contribution to the local economy, and to identify recommendations on how to best support the COVID-19 recovery in the arts, culture, and heritage sector. Uh, the study's in the final stages of completion and we're hoping to present to council in the next couple months. Art Walk, the amazing Stephanie Myers and her team put together an incredible 33rd annual Art Walk celebration. As artist support has continued to be paramount, we've continued to waive all fees and commissions that we would normally charge to participating artists. All visual artists who applied were chosen, had the opportunity to be showcased in our visual gallery, in our virtual gallery. And we also had several smaller in-person galleries across town. So we created a kind of hybrid version of Art Walk this year. We connected with local businesses who have large media followings online and they became online venues and each business had two artists that they showcased on their channels over the summer and drove traffic back to the gallery where they could make purchases and we connected them directly with the Art Walk artists. We held two online openings featuring over 24 performers and they pre-recorded their sets and we had live hosts that we streamed from our offices in City Hall. So this was our new kind of development project this year. It's called Outside the Box, and it was our first ever installment uh, of a project which wires artists from across disciplines together to create cutting ed edge interdisciplinary work. Each artistic pod was composed of artists from a ride wide range of disciplines. They were not given any prompts or constraints. Over the course of several sessions, the pods developed their work into a piece that could be professionally filmed. Uh, it accumulated in a showcase video and artist talk presentation, which streamed this past Sunday, and uh, there were over 300 views on that, which was really great. And in this picture is Samante Cruz, who worked with collaborators B. Schroeder and Jen Burke on their piece, Purple Pain. 
we held our sixth annual Rural Artist Support Weekend, which provides opportunities for regional artists to participate in educational workshops that focus on the business of art. Uh, it featured speakers from the local business community, as well as representatives from Act Safe BC. And the events occurred in collaboration with the Civic Theater and were totally free of charge. And we had over 100 participants attend those six sessions. We uh, were able to collaborate with the Youth Action Network, the Youth Center, and ourselves to create the fourth Youth Arts Action Committee mural. Um, this time it was on the back of the Leafs Recycling Building. Seven youth worked together to create with two mentors who were Bryn Stevenson and Coleman Webb, and all the youth ended up receiving fit testing and safety training, and they led the design of the piece, and it really uh, beautied up that little market area back there. It's, it's totally stunning every time you see it. Instead of our regular annual dance educator showcase, which usually sees sold out crowds at the Capitol Theater, uh, we continued our pivot, which allowed us to create four films this year featuring solo dancers and local performance artists. It gave us the opportunity to engage with professional videographers again and ensured that local performance artists were paid professional wages for their work. Uh, we've created four shorts, which will be released in February of 2022. And pictured here is Hiromoto Ida, who collaborated with local music musician Tyler Isaacs de Jong. 2021 saw the return of our Bigby Place Arts Initiative, which was halted in March of 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, so this consists of bi-weekly arts classes for adults with diverse abilities and varying genres led by local professional artists. And we actually ended up receiving <coughs> so much interest from local arts educators that we've been able to book all of the sessions into the spring of 2023. So that's really exciting that that will keep going, um, especially because we have the support, generous support of the Columbia Basin Trust to to keep that program running for the next couple of years. So um, I'm only able to give you an idea of our expenditures in this presentation this evening um, because I do not have my revenues and deferrals finalized by our accountants. It's the beauty of a December 31 year end, um, but I will provide those to council and staff in February 2022 as soon as they are available. And so we can just cover that our expenses mostly covered artists, arts workers, contractors, and staff wages, which is amazing because we were able to feed many, many local arts families. Um, and our approximately approximate total expenditures for 2021 were $342,005. So our request this year, respectfully, is for $5,500 from the City of Nelson for our fiscal activities in 2022, $3,000 cash, and a $2,500 rental subsidy for our office located at 310 Ward Street. Thank you. And has... Oh, oh sorry. sorry. I'm almost done. Sorry. Just, just one more minute. Am I cut off? Not yet, Sarah? No, Winter, not at all. No, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> so we're... Um, we're hoping that our future involves lots of community gatherings, dances, and celebrations, but until that's possible, we are committed to ensuring that our programming continues to support local artists and arts workers financially and through other means. Um, we're looking forward to developing our 2022 to 2025 strategic plan this spring, <coughs> um, and also for the potential for our programming that we've developed around the BCAC Arts Impact Grant. Um, and. That is it from us. I, we are very, very grateful to you, the City of Nelson, for your continued support of our programming. And I'm very happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you very much, Sydney. Okay. Now, if, how, how do any I get out of here? Questions from Council? How do I give you back your screen? Is oh, yeah, my okay. question. That, yeah. That's the first thing we got to do because I've just got a couple of faces on the screen right now. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Gabe, any yeah, tips? I think you're gonna have to. Oh, here we go. There we go. Did it. Sorry about that. I'm an arts person. <laughs> okay, there we go. Any questions from council? Um, hearing none. So, Sydney, I, I just oh. one thing I wanted to mention Jan to you. Oh, Jan Janice, Janice, I see you now. I see you now. Go ahead, Janice. Yeah. I just I just want to say thank you to um, Sydney. Lots of accolades went out to the CDC, but I remember a time that I sat around the council table and I was totally of the mind that uh, the Nelson and Area Arts Council was definitely not going to be in existence within about three or four months of their 
last presentation and then and then you came along and so I think that um, I know you have a hard-working team but I think a lot of credit goes to you to um, pulling it from the brink of despair back to an organization that uh, managed to spend three hundred and almost fifty thousand dollars and only needed five thousand dollars from the city of Nelson to get it done so um, kudos to you and um, great schedule of events and I look forward to all of the events for 2022. Thank you, Janice. Yeah, I'm very, very fortunate. Best team ever. Huge group of people who helped make this happen. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, Sydney, I had a couple of things I wanted to mention to you. And as I just looking through the paperwork here, I noticed in 1969, the Kootenai Columbia Arts Council and Regional Area Nelson and District Arts Council, spanning from Bonington to the North Shore to Proctor to Queens Bay, Nelson to Apex. And... Um, at the bottom, you talk about the leverage you can gain from a little bit of funding from local government. And I'm wondering if uh, at some point you're intending to approach the directors, regional directors to represent those areas, that catchment area as well. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm Keep asking about that. So <laughs> I, I didn't see them listed in the revenue on the revenue side. I don't think there was anything listed on our revenue side because I didn't, I wasn't able to give you any financials. So, yeah, but I will have them. We receive yeah. um, the same amount of cash as we do from the city of Nelson from the regional district directors. Okay. Okay. Um, they are discretionary funds, so they're not built into their budget every year, but we receive yeah. between 2,500 and $5,000 of cash annually from, from E and F. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. I was referencing the, Nel the Nelson district arts council budget that's at the bottom of the, presentation there so thank you through the and mayor Sir Charwood. yeah okay I'm yeah good. thank you yeah you're not i just wanted to make another comment and say thank you i echo um councillor morrison thanks for those comments and i would just like to uh thank your team personally you know when we've had these waves come through uh, I know that you got me dancing in my living room and got my teens up dancing. And I just want to, um, yeah, express my gratitude for just that mental health support that you guys provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so just so everybody knows, when you put your hand up, I don't see it here. Gabe sees it on his computer. So I'm relying on him to prompt me when somebody wants to speak as well. So. Just bear with us. It's a little difficult when the screen is filled up as much as it is tonight. Sydney, uh, once again, thank you very much. Appreciate thank that you. very much. Thank you. And up next is uh, Capital Theatre. Hello. Hello, yes. This is a joint presentation. Heather is hopefully going to get our uh, slides up. I'm yeah. Claire Hallam, I'm the chair of the board, and Heather Shippett is here, she's the vice chair, Stephanie Fisher is here, she's the executive director, and Ian Wood is here too, I think, he's our bookkeeper. Uh, this presentation will outline the variety of ways that the Capitol Theatre deployed funding over the past year in our commitment to recognize the importance <laughs> of the performing arts in our community, to support artists and retain the relevance of our iconic live performance venue. While other theatres have been shuttered, Executive Director Stephanie Fisher applied for COVID emergency funding to sustain the theatre's traditional way of operating, while at the same time innovated and adapted to ensure artists in the theatre are able to explore exciting new opportunities. We had a full professional artist touring season lined up when the artist travel came to a stop. It was a heartbreaking and immensely stressful process for us as presenters to first postpone and then cancel shows and rentals. In response, we created Homegrown, a series of local performers on the stage. Unfortunately, after only three live shows, we were not able to present even these local <coughs> performances with an audience in attendance. So we launched a successful online fundraising campaign for live streaming and recording equipment. We trained our technicians and moved to recording, streaming, and live streaming on stage presentations. Our experienced technical staff now allows us to satisfy often complex technical and special requirements to offer a variety of alternative streams of engagement. This past fall, we also saw a return to our touring season featuring a cabaret show on the life of Jose Josephine Baker. 
Harry Manx, Bally Colonna and Mike Delamont also performed. We are allowed 50% audience capacity and so far we've had a good audience turnout who are thankful to see live theatre. Last year was also a time to explore other platforms to present our special programming, including a digital presentation of the sixth annual Indigenous Culture Celebration. We held a number of Zoom conversations, workshops and discussions following performance screenings. With our technical expertise and support from outside funders, we purchased additional equipment, allowing us to explore other avenues of, of income. We worked with Health Arts this last year, recording local musicians for their outreach program to seniors. Despite the pandemic, we continue to be a resource for artists and arts organizations who make use of our technical expertise, professional sound, lighting, and film equipment. And during a short window of lifted restrictions, we were able to offer a week-long arts residency with workshops and film documentaries. We produced a dance piece and a documentary exploring the creative process that went into dancer Hiro, Hir Hiromoto Ida's development of Homecoming 2020. This past July 1st, we also produced the film Relations and Reflections as a way to reconcile the horror of the discovery of the unmarked graves at the former residential school in Kamloops at a time when we are yearning for connection and grappling with what it means to belong to this land. We were able to continue our summer youth production this past July, which culminated in three live performances on a one month long streamed presentation. Moving forward, the Capitol will be continuing its programming as well as producing films and videos and supporting local BC, Canadian and international artists. We are continuing our youth and community outreach programming as well as production of our own shows. We have almost completed the plans for our 22-23 season starting in the fall. We will carry on with offering streamed events. In July, we'll see the return of our summer youth pr production. Audio and video recording will feature prominently in our rental schedule, even as we continue to imagine ways to expand how we are able to offer this treasured community space. And building projects continue. We finally finished the fire safety upgrades, and last week we completed the renovation of the dressing rooms. We'll continue with facility upgrades as grants come available. And we will continue to plan and implement our vision to create a cultural hub for Nelson in collaboration with Oxygen Arts Centre and other partners who have expressed interest. We have been asked to pivot, go digital, innovate, be resilient, keep audiences involved and be sustainable under the pressure of public health orders. And today we are worried, excited, exhausted and hopeful. The following slides will provide a financial view into the Capital Theatre operations. The city has supported the Capitol Theatre since 1990 with operating funding. In the last 10 years, this funding has increased from 50,000 to 70,000, where the average annual inflation rate between 90, 1990 and 2021 is 2.71%. However, the city increase has been 0.8. An average adjusted inflation rate of 2% would bring city support up to 126,000. In 1990, the Capitol had two full-time staff and between 30 and 50 shows a year, with many community shows in the beginning slowly increasing over the years. By 2005, the theatre had developed a strong presence in Nelson and one part-time position was added. The number of shows presented increased to 110, including community shows, capital shows and rentals. City funding remained at 55,000. The theatre has grown significantly over the last 10 years. Prior to COVID, we had on average 130 performances a year with our own capital season series, classical music series, family series, community productions, and collaborations and rentals. This is not counting rehearsal days for shows. Today, we have two full-time and four part-time staff. That's six staff plus a bookkeeper on contract. The city funding for 2017 to 2019 was 67,500. To revitalize the community support and patronage, we seek to hire an additional staff member for community engagement and outreach. This position is part of the reopening and sustainability planning as we open and try to get back to normal by the fall of 2020, with all our fingers crossed. We receive wage subsidies and didn't lay off staff. However, we are still operating on a 50% capacity, which still has a severe financial impact on ticket sales and renters returning to us. In the last five years, our current wages have increased from 153 to 170,000, which presents a 2% rise with inflation. 
to pay our staff at average industry standard would bring our payroll up to 207,000, and this doesn't figure in the new position. All our staff are paid below the industry average, which will impact succession planning for us. Our staff does not have a health benefit package. The shortfall to bring staff wages in line is 37,000. Because we are keeping ticket prices, rental fees, and workshop fees affordable, performance activities will not generate this additional revenue. The new position of engagement and outreach would require funding of 23,000, with the theatre contributing 10 of it from a private donor. We have been able to manage the financial affairs in a responsible manner. Our operating expenses have been within the 64 to 72,000 threshold for the last five years. Funding has been sequestered for all recent major renovations from outside sources, which was over $300,000 in 2020-21. The city funding covers wages for ongoing annual building maintenance and all other wage expenses have been covered by programming revenues. What we anticipate in 22-23 is that the return to full programming will see an upward trend in expenses. Building maintenance with the age of the theatre is a constant. Insurance costs will increase primarily due to the coverage of the theatre seating. And general administrative costs will increase, as will utilities, to, so that our general expenses will rise to about 80000 the increase in operating expenses due to inflation and return to full programming amount to about $10,000, which we don't have funded. Our proposal is to increase our current funding from $70,200 to $130,000. To bring staff wages in line with the market is $37,000. The new position for engagement and outreach is thirteen, dollars and increase to our operating expenses is ten, dollars which amounts to a total of $60,000. We would like to respectfully request Council's consideration of increasing the capital's funding close to where we would be if we had kept up with inflation, so the funding would go up to about 130000 a year. Thank you for your time, and the Board of Directors acknowledges that the land on which we operate is the unceded traditional territory of the Sinaiks Arrow Lake and the Yakanuki Lower Kootenai Band peoples. We also acknowledge the Métis Nation and Indigenous peoples who call this community home. Thank you. Okay, when you get your uh, presentation down, then we'll be able to see the rest of the participants, including Council. And Councillor Page, thank you for sending me that note saying that when a person puts their hand up, they'll end up on the top left-hand corner of the screen. So if you're in the top left-hand corner of the screen, <laughs> there's a good chance you'll be called on to Ask a question. Did I get that right, Councillor Page? They, we should we should shuffle over there. You can look for the hand still, of course. Yeah. But yeah, um, we get the we hand over to the Gabe's, one corner. Gabe's computer. So, do you have any hands up there? Uh, just uh, Councillor Page's hand. Only hand up at the moment is Councillor Page's, and you're not in the top left-hand corner of the screen. So. <laughs> then don't listen to me for tech support. You're not paying for it. So. You get that's the quality of the information you're getting. Councillor Lochtenberg, yeah. um, um, next. Are we shuffling somewhere? Are we together? We're okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I had a couple questions. So thank you so much for the fine work that you guys do. And uh, I'll, this is going to be a bit of a theme with some of my questions across the nonprofits. But I think it's something that I see reflected in the community is just a, a, a things sometimes are a little bit of a black box. And for people that are new to the cultural development sector and the nonprofit sector. Could I get a little bit of information on who should be who your membership is and who uh, who should try and join and become a member? Uh, how you guys recruit and develop your board? How what the process is to bring people uh, who are interested in leading uh, leading in succession, as you were talking in your presentation. How do they become board members? And how do you? Keep yourselves accountable to the strategic vision that you guys lay out uh, from time to time and keep yourselves uh, on track to what you hope to accomplish. Bethany, would you like me to? I'll start with that. When I'm talking about succession planning, I'm not really talking about the board. I'm really talking about staff because we have such excellent staff and they're so well trained and it's going to be very hard to replace them, especially if we're not offering market rates for the very technical jobs that they do. When it comes to the board, we have uh, 
we have strategic planning meetings every year uh, with a five-year strategic plan in place. Um, we explore all options for funding. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that Stephanie is incredible at getting grants. <clears throat> However, grants are often for capital expenses and not for operating expenses, which is kind of where we have the biggest issue. Were, did I miss a question? Yeah, how do, who, who's your membership and who do you who do you reach out into the community to develop your membership and how do they become interested in the board if they were to become interested? The membership of the board or membership of the theater? The theater membership, the organization's membership. So our theater membership is, uh, of course, our patrons. Like they make uh, a huge part of uh, who are our members. Um, how we reach them is uh, through our uh, marketing, like online uh, promotion of our shows. We have a newsletter and are very active on social media. We, we have seen that uh, in the, over the last two years, um, because we, we couldn't really have people on stage or very few people in the audience, like 50 people or half capacity the last few months, that it, uh, it is uh, important for us to basically fill a position that is an outreach uh, and engagement position. And this is not only the capital theater, this conversation is being held on a provincial and on a national level. How can theaters get back their membership and their audiences? Because audiences are still not comfortable coming out. We are still in a pandemic and how, and we have to reach out to our, to our different groups to bring them back into the fold, especially youth and children and young parents, like all the, the members and audiences we had, they have been staying away. And I would also like to add just one thing in terms of board development. Um, we, are, we are doing a lot of work and in the last few years, um, in terms of Stephanie's been helping us find workshops that help us learn more about grant writing as a board. We're talking about doing some personal work as a board um, around truth and reconciliation and our own understanding of decolonizing um, theater practices. And so Stephanie's been instrumental in helping the board or ourselves get that education and, and come together. We're also talking about how we can encourage more diverse uh, board members, people coming and joining us. So all of that work is, is ongoing as well, um, as well as our strategic and financial planning. Uh, thank you. Councillor Lochtenberg. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for that presentation, ladies. Uh, I just a quick question about um, your fundraising in respect to the donor campaigns. Um, I understand that you've got like a number of donation levels for donors up to the impresario, um, producer, impresario, et cetera. Um, I, I apologize if I didn't catch it, but did you do, and do you do like sort of year end donation drives? And, um, on top of that, what is your, do you, have you thought about, or do you have, do you regularly sort of review? your donor campaign so you can um, sort of more optimize sort of the monthly givings uh, that <clears throat> where does that fit into your into your priorities so we do a uh, year end donation drive uh, uh, which we usually uh, we send out cards and invitations like before Christmas to mm -hmm. think about the capital theater um, the last two years, we had quite a few business sponsors, and the last two years, we have not reached out to them as much as we usually would do, 
because the small businesses were also kind of in a crunch situation with the pandemic. But we still had a few of our businesses um, come and donate to us. And we did our online fundraising campaign uh, for, for the that we could actually pivot towards digital and online. And uh, usually as soon as we have some funding available, ascending comes to search for where can we go and match the funding either with a private donor or through grant funding from provincial or federal government. Okay. We, and, uh, we have found it's easier to get people to donate to a specific cause. So when we needed to uh, get new equipment the, for the audio and, the, and recording equipment, it was very easy to ask people for something specific. We find that at the theatre, it's a bit harder to get people to put money in year after year if it's not going to a specific goal. So that's something that we're working on as a board is, is how do we frame that in a way that people can say, look what I did, because that's what they like to see. Yeah, and operating, having access to operate funding is uh, very different for us than for organizations who are funded through the BC Arts Council. We are not funded uh, as, um, as one of the operating clients. So we, we uh, Throughout COVID, we didn't get that um, emergency funding. Like our emergency funding came more through the wage subsidy. So it was kind of one funding we could access. And then there was other funding pockets where it gave us funding to directly support artists. So we could take off 10% of um, of uh, admin funding, but the rest needed to be spent on artists. So our funding structure relies very much on the donations and then of course to 80% or 85% of ticket sales. Like that's our main income. Uh, okay, follow up. Yes, go ahead. Um, Thanks for that. That's that's really helpful. And I, I just want to stress for the public who may be listening that a donation to the Capitol Theater is tax deductible. That's correct? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. We're a organization. yeah. Okay. And then the final point I would make is when I did direct somebody to the website to, to make a donation, it was a little tricky to find. There was, there was some digging. I'm just wondering if you might want to <laughs> highlight that just to make it a little easier for, for people to... Um, to, to, to get to. Certainly, I can talk to our techs about that, yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Page, you had one more comment? Yeah, just listening to the discussion and, and your uh, gap in operational funding that you want to fill long term for the sustainability of the uh, remuneration for your staff, what is, what is the subscription model that you have, like I said, we, I, I know if the traditional one, you can sign up for a season once a year, and, and, and I'm sure there's a membership fee as well for people who want to be involved in the governance side of things, but what about smaller increments and monthly payments and uh, auto renewals? What kind of stuff have you guys looked at in terms of kind of catching someone and keeping them on uh, a regular contribution that also comes with very degrees of benefits that flow into the capital theater? Yeah. Yeah, people can certainly do that, and we have um, we have members who do that. They do the monthly donation um, or the weekly donation, and uh, for the tax receipts, like that's all available on our website. I'm, I'm actually asking a little bit more on the subscription side for you know seasons tickets uh, you know passes that are maybe get you a few shows a year that you can redeem you know those kind of bite-sized places maybe i don't want to spend three or four hundred dollars a year but maybe i have a budget for 200 and i want to redeem it as long as i you know there are level packages yeah. that you can that you can purchase as a subscriber and you can choose different 
um, you know, numbers of, of shows you might attend a year or a certain series that you might attend a year. So we do have those leveled subscriptions um, available to, to uh, so we do have ongoing continued uh, subscribers that, that buy every year um, and, and different levels of it. So some people just come to classical music and they can pick a four show package and some people come to six shows. So uh, we do have that subscription level already ongoing. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Heather. And do they do they auto renew? Nay, yeah, it's difficult to auto renew because we have uh, new shows every year. Like I don't know how. <laughs> if you have a brilliant idea, how you auto renew if you don't know what kind of shows are there? <laughs> yeah. It's a good suggestion, though. Yeah. You could, you could, yeah. we could look at that for sure. Okay, I think okay, uh, it's definitely uh, something yeah. worth looking at. Uh, Councillor think... Renwick is next, but I just want to follow up on what Councillor Page said. And I, I don't think we really captured what he was talking about. Like he's basically saying, if you had a two hundred dollar donation, that would allow you to go to the theater on your two hundred dollars ran out. So, or four hundred, or three hundred, or one hundred, whatever. Uh, so, auto renew as an example. I have a membership at the public uh, television knowledge network, and it's automatically renewed. But I have no idea what they're going to show me. You know, in the following year, but I still it's still automatic renewed. So, I mean, it's a it's a great idea, um, and I think most people know. In regular times, you have X amount of shows annually. In normal times, <laughs> and uh, you know, you could buy a two hundred dollar auto renew that would get you to four of those shows, or maybe you don't go to any. Maybe you just make that as a donation. You know, so it's a yeah. Good idea. It's definitely something we will bring up in a board meeting. That's a good idea. See if that's so, possible. Councillor Renwick yeah, thank you. Uh, was next on the speakers list. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Stephanie, Claire, Heather. Thank you. Um, I can only imagine what what you've gone through in the last two years. And um, I, I, Stephanie, I know that you know the, the great admiration I have for the theater and, and my feelings there. And and please, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But Claire, you mentioned in your presentation that you're trying to keep rental prices and ticket prices affordable. You know, every time you step into the Capitol Theater, it's a special experience. And everybody is charging more for everything. Please don't sell yourself short. You can probably charge more and, and create more income. But that's my, my sort of my word of advice coming from a business person is, Everybody else is doing the same, and it's a great experience. And you guys are paying more for everything, so therefore the prices do have to go up. So um, you know, as a board, you can certainly talk about that. And it's um, you know, this is free advice, and you know what free advice is worth. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Renwick. Okay, seeing no more hands up, Gabe. Right. Um, Thank you all very much for all your commitment to the Capitol Theatre. And I hope to be in there soon, uh, sooner rather than later. So thanks very much. All right. Up next, we have uh, Touchstones. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here tonight and seeing all your faces. Um, I. Uh, and presenting a video tonight on behalf of Astrid Herdal, who was unable to uh, to attend the meeting tonight. Uh, and we also have um, Sheila Achilles, Nelson Ames, and Sue Adam from the board here as well. Uh, and they're available to answer questions um, after the video. So I'll turn my my video off and hopefully run this. Sorry, just have some. I just take your time. It, it'll eventually show up, I'm sure. <clears throat> Um, meanwhile, while you're setting that up, the building looks fantastic with all the work that was done on the exterior. Uh, you can sure see the difference, and uh, it's just one of the most beautiful buildings in town, isn't it? Yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. Yeah. So 
sorry. There we go. Good. Here we go. <laughs> Apologies. There we go. <clears throat> Evening, Mayor, Council, and staff, and of course, greeting to the citizens of Nelson. My name is Astrid Herdal, and I'm the Executive Director of Touchstones Nelson Museum of Art and History. My pleasure to be here to present to the city. It is undeniable that Touchstones matters locally, regionally, provincially, and even nationally economic impact, cultural value, and mental health benefits of the arts and heritage sector are fully understood internationally. In all that we do, we endeavor to align with the TRC calls to action and national best practices in diversity, equity, access, and inclusion to ensure that museums, galleries, and archives can truly become the sites of social justice, anti-racism, and collective community empowerment that we can. The City of Nelson provides Touchstone Nelson Museum with an operating grant which in 2021 provided 27% of our revenue. This funding is used to leverage significant regional, provincial, and federal funding to the benefit of Nelson area. Without this grant, we would not bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars into our community. Funds which directly impact Nelson and provide economic stimulus through job creation, increased tourism, and local contractors with interior revitalization and renovation projects the Bunker and 502 Burning Street, a city-owned building. For 2022, we are requesting that the City of Nelson honors the 2% increase to our operating grant to account for inflation. We are currently at 2015 funding level. If 2% increases have been given since 2015, 2022 funding levels would be $265,000. This is our request. The aggregate expenses of the organization and inflation across Canada and BC have an increase beyond this 2%. Not having our increase erodes the capacity of our organization for expanding community contribution. Mayor and Council, I know that you understand the significance and importance of the work that we do and that you truly value and understanding of our past in order to better shape our future. The City Grant enables the Nelson Museum to enact our vital mandate and service to the City of Nelson and citizens of the region to provide exceptional professional museum standard care for Nelson and Mary's archives, heritage sites, history collection, as well as to curate our two public art galleries which showcase the work of outstanding Canadian artists for Nelson and visitors. In the fall of 2021, Sheila Achilles, the chair of the Nelson Museum Board and I met with a few City of Nelson senior staff to start the process of developing a service agreement. We are thrilled to work with the City of Nelson on this process. I'm so excited that you are all willing to align with Canadian practices for museum funding. The city recognizes the critical nature of holding the archives and museum collection and bringing contemporary Canadian art to Nelson and area residents and visitors alike. I look forward to going on this journey. Now we come to 2021 and our ongoing COVID response. In this time of continued global uncertainty, the Nelson Museum continues to pivot and hold to our values and mission vision mandate and to the service we provide to our community. We have not asked the City of Nelson for any emergency funding, but have brought regional, provincial, and federal support into the community of Nelson and to ensure the ongoing sustainability of the Nelson Museum. 2021 emergency funding allowed us to account for a decrease in earned revenue, as well as greater expenses brought on by virtual programming, health and safety protocols and building changes, and the challenges of ongoing remote working within the heritage sector. Last year, during our presentation, we expressed that COVID-19 and the resulting financial impact of the arts and heritage sector revealed a funding vulnerability and insecurity for Touchstone Nelson Museum due to a lack of service agreement. We are so pleased that the City of Nelson is willing to discuss an ongoing solution to this concern. Despite ongoing challenges within the sector and our entire global community, we continue to serve 
Nelson. Despite the proliferation of misinformation and an era of divisiveness, we strive for unity and to move forward in doing our part in decolonization, reconciliation, and social justice. 2021 exhibition season brought international press, exceptional community participation, and a great deal of critical dialogue. We saw phenomenal exhibitions such as Jamie Black's Red Dress Project, Throne, a group ceramics exhibition supported by the Canada Council for the Arts, All Things Considered, Time Warp, a retrospective of the work of John McKinnon, JJ Levin's Alone Time and Queer Portraits, and the collaborative community curated Kootenai Pride, We Love a Parade. We also continued and began successful projects such as the digitization of the Nelson Daily News, the digitization of the Shaw TV collection and multiple audio collections, virtual art lab family programming, virtual school tours and in-person school tours, interactive virtual artist talks and panel discussions, and much more. In addition, we are recognized provincially through Heritage BC for our exceptional work in revitalizing the school of Bunker. In 2021, Touchstones Nelson Museum worked with Bill and Ann McDonnell to merge the Nelson Sports Museum into Touchstones Nelson Museum bring this important collection into the next phase of its journey. This was an exceptionally important and exciting endeavor that we undertook in 2021. Due to diligent grant writing and emergency funding applications, we are solvent for 2021. This showcases our financial management capacity, leadership, and resiliency as an organization. As previously mentioned, the City of Nelson Grant accounted for 27% of our revenue. This grant covered building operational expenses and insurance in the amount of $140,000, and the remaining portion of the city grant covered 26% of staff wages. The rest of our operational budget was covered by other grants and earned and contributed revenue. I would like to point out that 18% of our budget covered the cost of all 2021 exhibitions in RSV, a comparable number to 20% going toward the building and insurance. It is very important to recognize how much the Nelson Museum does to care for the city of Nelson building. It is a part of our core operation and the majority of the City of Nelson Grant goes toward the city-owned 502 Vernon Street building. Although 2021 saw continued emergency support for our sector nationally and provincially, 2022 still brings some uncertainty in the field and funding models. It is therefore vital that we continue our meticulous financial management. Ongoing City of Nelson support will enable us to continue to access additional grants, which will greatly benefit our community. 2022 and 2023 funding and the state of our sector continue into the unknown. Nonetheless, the Nelson Museum is moving forward with innovative spirit, clear goals, and a strategic plan which will further connect our organization with history while expanding its future reach. With ongoing city support, we can further leverage funding, collaborate on heritage projects such as the Ladybird display, captivate more audiences, and further break down systemic issues within our sector. We have very exciting projects lined up with confirmed funding, such as the Public Art Project on Vernon Street, and projects that are still funding dependent, such as the third floor revitalization in New Orleans. We hope to hear soon about these grants. We have asked for $265,000 for 2022, which is an increase of $37,000 from 2021 levels. But as stated previously, $265,000 would bring us to what 2022 levels ought to have been with yearly inflation increases since 2015. This would still not cover our expansion to our operations with the Bunker Sports Museum and many more endeavors which benefit the community. We are taking responsibility for our growth and we hope that the City of Nelson will join us in this quest. Your support is vital. Your ongoing support ensures that we can care for your building and leverage hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional funding which benefits the city, citizens of Nelson and area, and visitors to this great place. We look forward to further enhancing our collaborative relationship with the City of Nelson for the betterment of our community. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. Touchstones Nelson Museum of Art and History acknowledges that the museum resides on the traditional, unceded territory of the Sinaiaks and Chinooka nations. We would like to thank and acknowledge the Sinaiaks, Yakanuki Chinooka, and the IT people for the opportunity to live learn and share in cultural experiences in this beautiful place. We recognize indigenous law and protocol of this land and continue to build lasting and reciprocal relationships with the Sinaiaks people through the Sinaiaks Confederacy and the Confederated Tribes of the Coal Reservation, Naka Nation through the Yakanuki or Kuti Band, the Chinaha Nation Council, the Nation of British Columbia through the West Kuti Nation Association. Thank you.
thank you everybody and uh, if you have any questions um, we do have our board members here uh, who can, can step in and answer them thanks thank you uh, Janice Morrison Councillor Morrison is that your hand going up no okay um, seeing none Oh, I'll get it started. Okay, Councillor Page. <clears throat> I'm sure. I'm sure things will loosen up once I once I ask my question. So, similar questions to the last round. So, where do you recruit new members uh, to the organization uh, from the participants? Uh, how do you select or elect people to your board? And uh, what are your strategic priorities for 2022? And how do you guys keep yourself accountable to them? You have to find that unmute button somewhere. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So what I said was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks very. Thanks very much, Keith, for for kicking this off. Um, and thank you very. Thank you very much for listening to the presentation. My apologies for Astrid not being present in person, but honestly, we do everything this way these days, so it's nothing new. Um, <laughs> Our membership, our membership uh, actually, we're very proud of our member numbers, and um, we have various ways, the same as the Capitol Theatre, of gaining membership at, at the Touchstones Museum. And, and one of the most fruitful ways is people that come into our wonderful gallery shop, and they're always asked every single time, are you a member? Yes, great, thank you. If you're not a member, this is what it will give you. And being a member at Touchstones actually does give you a wonderful um, array of opportunities um, if you're a member, you get into the galleries for free for an entire year. You get a discount in the gallery shop, etc. So I think uh, and it's also very reasonable. So maybe we could take Cal Renwick's advice and raise the membership fees. But uh, at this point in time, we're, we're going to stay, stay status quo. And that, that's really how we get our membership. We've been very active on social media as well. Um, Steph Delnia, who is present, is our new marketing coordinator and um, really brought us into a, a different uh, generation of, of media. So that's been great for us. Um, board recruitment. Um, we're actively always looking to recruit. Our board is almost full right now, which we're very proud of. And uh, one of the things that we do do on the board is we have a skills matrix um, form that we fill out so that we know really where our gap is in our board and what, we're, what we really need to move forward. So um, it, it helps us in recruitment and, uh, and opportunities of talking to people that really, for example, and it's not necessarily what we need right now, but if we need an accountant on the, on the board, that would be someplace where we would put our energies. But um, board recruitment, I think, for every board is always ongoing. And any opportunity that we have, um, we talk to people about how wonderful it would be on the board of Touchstones. Your third question, Keith. Uh, keeping accountable to your strategic priorities and what they might be for 2022. Uh, absolutely. Well, one of the things that we did do, I'll, I'll hand this off to either Sue or Nelson as well, but one of the things we did um, moving into COVID, uh, normally we would have a strategic plan of five years. Um, we actually honed that down to two years. So it's a 2021-2022 strategic plan. Because of the uncertainty and the unknowns over the, the few years that we're going through right now, and that's really helped us be more present in what some of our goals are. Our strategic plan is um, reviewed at every single board meeting and uh, in the report of the executive director. So we stay current with our strategic plan and the priorities that we have. Um, I know that Astrid referred to a number of things that we would be a priority this year. And certainly the third floor renovation for, um, for operational funding is, is so very important. It's literally kind of crumbling up there and then of course the redoing of the museum um, and looking at the truth and reconciliation and and the guidelines in that document so um, uh, sue or nelson please feel free to add to that uh, yes this is sue adam i was just going to mention that uh, nelson and i have um, uh, taken on the role of development committee uh, with, of course, the addition of the, the chair and Astrid. And what we're looking at is long-term planning for um, uh, legacy donations and other kinds of things that aren't year-to-year -year fundraising. We've separated those out into two different functions. 
So we're looking as um, uh, throughout the community for various ideas for long-term planning for donations for the museum. Any other hands? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Charwood, I believe you may have a question or a comment. You don't? She's on mute. You're on mute, yeah. I know that mute button. I don't hey, know. Hey, man. I'm not sure why they hide that mute button in the weirdest places on the computer. <laughs> it should no, be the I just didn't the press it. But anyway. Right <laughs> thanks, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. Um, my question, or yeah, my question is around the service agreement. And I'm not sure how much of that can be discussed here, but I'm curious about the comment in the presentation of, of uh, bringing our museum to a sort of museum standard. Um, beyond the money, what is that agreement about? I, I, for some reason, I missed the beginning of your, of your question. It got garbled for me. Oh, am I, uh, am I clear now, Sheila? Yes. So it's around the service agreement, and I'm oh, not okay. sure how much can be discussed. But I was so I, I framed it in the context of there's sort of a, a museum standard out there that we're we're trying to elevate to. Yes. Could you speak to that piece for me, please? Yes, yes, and I I, I won't speak a lot about it um, because it is actually currently under discussion, but. Um, uh, the museum standard is that many museums, and the majority of museums, are really um, funded under service agreements within the community within the, which, which they reside. And that's really what we were referring to about bringing it up to this, the museum standard. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Next on our agenda is the uh, CAST presentation, uh, Visitor Center. Hello. Can everyone hear me? That's not the one. Yeah. Sorry, was that everyone can hear me okay? Um, sorry about that, but his CAST is up next and the Visitor Center will be the one after that, sorry. The right one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Nelson Innovation okay. Center. Go ahead. Yeah. Perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. So, thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, so, I'm Melanie Fontaine, manager for the Kootenai Association for Science and Technology, CAST. So I will be presenting today on the Nelson Innovation Center, um, along with Cecilia and Emily from the City of Nelson. So before I get into the presentation, I wanted to acknowledge that, as you're all aware, CAST has undergone um, extensive staff change over in the last year. So I joined CAST just about four months ago. Um, I brought on another staff member, and we have been pushing forward every program and initiative at CAST, getting things running again, as well as launching new additional programming that I will be briefly mentioning later in the presentation. So I want you to be assured that CAST is strong. We've got renewed energy, and we are extremely ambitious and excited for this next year of growth. So my purpose here today is to focus on the Nelson Innovation Center, the NIC. So the concept for this space began many executive directors ago, and it's been a collective drive for a community hub to connect, support local technology, entrepreneurs and businesses, and providing a physical space for collaboration events and to deliver programming. So through this hub, we are attracting business to the region and improving the skill set of our local workforce. Direct support for this initiative came from the City of Nelson, Nelson and Area Economic Development Partnership, Nelson and District Chamber of Commerce, as well as Community Futures Central Kootenai. So through this incredible collaboration of funding and support, the NIC was built and is now managed by CAST. And I want to emphasize that. CAST manages the space, however, it truly is the output of numerous local supports aimed at benefiting the public. 
So for this reason, I want to ensure that the space is utilized to its best potential, impacting the community and bringing awareness to our city priorities. So we're at the beginning of a new partnership to utilize the NIC space in a collaboration with the City of Nelson to emphasize sustainability and a clean future. So the NIC would continue to serve the tech community, entrepreneurs and other CAS programming with the addition of a climate innovation hub. So underlying every new technology or innovative idea, there still has to be that concept of sustainability and ensuring that our economic growth as a community is directly connected to our goals for a healthy and safe city, taking action against climate change. So by creating this partnership, we greatly increase our impact on the community, our value to the city, and our ability to find innovative solutions to local issues. So CAS has been around since 1998, and it has an extensive history of successful programming. So while this presentation is focused on the creation of a climate innovation hub, I do also want to note some recent and continuing programs that are being led by CAST and are based out of the NIC. So we successfully ran the Kootenai Pitch Competition. This was watched by over 2,000 viewers and broadcast from the NIC. CAST is also the administrator of the Nelson Tech and Knowledge Workers Facebook group. This now has over 1,100 members and daily posts and discussions. A long running core program delivered by CAST is our Venture Acceleration Program. And this helps early stage entrepreneurs grow their companies through mentorship. So through a sublet space at the NIC, we actually have NRC IRAP in adjacent offices to CAST. And this allows local companies access to more information and program possibilities. So CAST recently led the Regional Digital Economy Rapid Response and Resiliency Program, that's DER3. So this was a, an Innovate BC initiative through our BC Accelerator Network, and we assisted over 300 small and medium businesses across the Kootenays with their digital needs to get online during the pandemic. Um, of interest of these uh, assisted businesses, over 100 of them were located in Nelson. So an additional program that was just launched under the new CAST management is the Women in Tech Entrepreneurship Mastermind Program. So this is a structured hybrid workshop series for Kootenai women based out of the Nelson Innovation Centre. The first workshop was delivered on January 13th and half of this cohort's participants are based in Nelson as well. So with all that success, what's the next story? So we have found that during the pandemic, there was that shift on, that occurred to online and virtual program delivery. This has worked for many sectors and many of our programs, however, has not been an ideal situation for the physical space of the NIC. So moving forward, we know that bringing the public into this space is to everyone's advantage. So I will now pass the conversation over to Cecilia, who will touch on a few ideas for the creation of a climate innovation hub. Uh, lovely. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So we are incredibly excited about um, our partnership with the Nelson Innovation Center. Obviously, uh, the people in this room have heard me say before that our Nelson Next Climate Plan is really going to take everybody in our community if we're going to be successful in its implementation. And so we are incredibly excited about the idea of starting a climate innovation hub in the Nelson Innovation Center because we see this as really being a place where if you are somebody in our community who wants to know what's going on in the climate action space, how you get involved and are curious about the city's climate action programs, the Nelson Innovation Center would be that public facing place where you could actually come and visit and get to know what's going on. Um, you can jump to the next slide, Melanie, that's great. Yeah, so this vision for a climate innovation hub is really about trying to bring together all of the different people in our community who are working on climate action. And so that is obviously really important for a technology center um, sector, excuse me, because we know that a lot of our climate action programs are technology focused as well. Of course, we have our clean tech organics diversion program coming up and we have an e-bike financing program. And so we would love this to be a place where residents could come down and potentially, you know, see an e-bike and spin it around the block and get to know how they may access that e thousand dollar financing program or if they're curious about a heat pump and they want to learn about energy retrofits they could come down and and contact some information about that and so that's one piece of it and then the other piece is really this collaboration piece and we think that this innovation hub is really going to help us 
um, you know, be more competitive with those grant applications that we're seeking all the time because it really shows that Nelson is going to be that leading space where if you're somebody who wants to work on climate action, you would be looking to Nelson to see what they're doing. Um, and so I know that Neil Dobson is on the call right now, and I'd love to just invite Neil to say a couple words about um, the connection between Foresight and Nelson Next and this Climate Innovation Hub. Um, Neil, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, delighted to join you this evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. And really, it's just an opportunity for me to uh, add my uh, support for the work that the city is trying to do and the work that CAST are trying to do. Foresight is Canada's biggest clean tech accelerator. We run acceleration programs. We run engagement, um, ecosystem building, and kind of peer learning programs. And we also run industrial decarbonization sort of tech adoption type programs as well. So we have programming right through and I'm working with the federal and provincial governments right now on a something called the BC Net Zero Innovation Network and I've been talking to city staff and uh, CAST about uh, collaborating on this program and make sure that we're activating our bioeconomy plans, our mining plans and some of the other ones in Nelson uh, in conjunction with the Innovation Centre. So I just wanted to share that we're fully supportive and uh, likewise the city and CAST are fully supportive of what we're trying to do to try and build out the network and create connections into the rest of the province. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. That's excellent. And so we just wanted to bring that in as an example of in practice, this is the type of thing that could be linked into the Innovation Centre. And so what this will mean for us is that we'd love to have actual in-person installations that residents can come and see. These would be changing over time. Um, but of course, we know that the Nest Lab, for example, would be something that makes sense to have people actually come in contact with some of the work being done there, as well as our climate action programs that are run directly out of the city. We'd also like to host regular drop-in hours so residents can actually come down and talk to either a member of our climate and energy team or an ambassador of some of our programs to get to know what's available. And we'd also like to see this as a public engagement space. Um, so, for example, you guys know that the engagement for the active transportation corridor that's being designed right now is ongoing. And so we've just connected Matt Kuzak with the Innovation Centre to do some of that engagement um, using that space as well. And so we really see this bringing a lot of value um, yeah, to the work that we're doing and really a great space to be engaging the community in, in the climate action work. And so with that, I'd like to invite Emily to share a little bit that's specific to our Organics Diversion Program. Um, and then I'll wrap things up and pass it back to M Melanie. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm the Program Coordinator with the Organics Diversion Program for the City of Nelson. Um, We're very excited to be able to utilize this space for the duration of the Organics Program launch and the implementation phases. Um, there'll be an excellent opportunity to opportunity to utilize this space for various purposes. Um, residents could come and pick up their their appliance and their, their bins at this location and then they can um, interact with some of the ed education materials, perhaps meet one of our ambassadors and talk about the usage of the appliance. Um, this space will also be um, a great space for residents to talk about, to interact with us and talk about potentially returns and repairs and to get some feedback from the program and to really be able to refine it and make it better for our residents. And I will pass it right back to Cecilia. Thanks, Emily. And then the last piece with the organics diversion is that you guys know that we are working with Selkirk College to conduct research into local end uses for the pre-treated soil amendment. And we would really like to see that student housed within the Innovation Centre and also, um, also having that double role as being a climate action ambassador for us in that space as well. Melanie, I'll get you to jump forward one more. And so I'll just leave you with this, which is a little bit of an image about where the NIC is actually located. You can see this is a really great location uh, to be that connecting point in the community. And so you see we have the district chamber and commerce that's very close by. It's just a few steps from City Hall. So we really see this as a, a well-positioned location for us to be doing this work. That's great. I'll hand it back to you, Melanie. All right, so I will now go over a number of actionable items that CAST is looking to, to deliver in this coming year. 
So through the physical space of the NIC, we aim to continue tech meetups and guest speakers. We did hold an informal tech meetup in December with success, and we are now planning the February meetup. So we aim to have speakers and events focused as well on partner priorities. So perhaps this is a presentation in the near future from Bruce Hunter's electric vehicle or an information workshop series on the active transportation project. So through this increased partnership, we can share resources, collaborate on grant funding opportunities, and increase awareness for each other's events and programs. So this provides an opportunity for the public to develop interests, skills, and knowledge around technology, entrepreneurialism, and climate innovation all in one place. So CAS will continue to offer affordable shared workspaces. Uh, this includes our subtenants, Kootenai Culture Magazine and NRC IRAP. As well, we are now open for boardroom bookings, short-term hourly desk rental space, and we will soon have high-end webinar equipment for rent. So CAS will provide the NIC space for drop-in expert hours for the Nelson Next team and other climate innovation experts. Along with drop-in expert hours, CAS will also be available during set hours daily to allow the public to walk in and receive referrals, program applications, and advice on when an expert will be available for information. So CAS will continue to provide targeted programs based at the NIC to enhance business and economic development in the region. We will also provide a coordinator to direct the public to the right expert for their inquiry, assist in logistical support, and help with marketing. So the coordinator will also assist in producing a monthly newsletter and this will highlight uh, local innovative companies, clients that are in our VAP program, other CAS programming, as well as innovative climate initiatives. So through our marketing, we will support the city's sustainability call to action, increasing participation in the e-bike program or helping the community connect with home energy retrofit information. So together, we can enhance Nelson's innovation ecosystem, putting us on the map as a leader in this space. So what I'm asking is for your support to ensure that this is the year the NIC leads our community as an innovation hub. To be successful, we would like to employ one part-time event and marketing coordinator, along with management of the NIC being overseen by myself and Crystal Swan, our programs and communications specialist. So I'm asking for 40,000 for the 2022 year to allow us the hiring of that coordinator and the time to really put an emphasis on opening this space to the public. So another aspect I would like to mention, and it's not shown on this slide, is that I recognize that there was an ask in the 2021 year by my predecessor. Um, I'm also aware that it didn't go over as well as anyone would have hoped. However, from that, $40,000 was confirmed towards CAST. With the pandemic reopening uncertainty and changing staff, um, those funds were never delivered. So I would also like to ask that we receive just a portion of those confirmed funds. So during the 2021 year, we produced virtual programming, accrued expenses, employed staff, and we held online webinars. So I recognize that there were at least five to six months that there what we had reduced expensive expenses for lack of staff. So I would just like to ask for 20,000 of those confirmed funds to still be provided. And this would just allow me to end this fiscal budget um, for the NIC without a deficit. So on that note, I wanna thank you very much and feel free to ask as many questions as you can. Um, Mr. Mayor, I don't mind just making a couple comments before uh, questions. Um, you know, I just want to thank everyone. You know, the cast has been uh, excellent. Our climate team has been excellent. And Neil with Foresight, I think this is a truly innovative um, opportunity that will place us really, really well to attract, you know, talent, to attract um you know, the grants that are, are out there uh, and really put Nelson on the, you know, the map. I know uh, Councillor Lattenberg in his roles with the, with uh, committee work has, you know, has, you know, the, the other levels of government are, you know, are looking for um, innovation like this of how they, you know, how they can make progress on this. So, so I think we're extremely well placed, um, you know, I know Neil and, his team are, are have a large grant request um, out there that they're looking for uh, our support as part of that. And having this innovation center, I think, places us in a different position than almost any community out there. And, and certainly any community our side, we can certainly be the leaders. And, and, and I think that's nationally and possibly in, even internationally. So 
thanks all you guys excellent presentation and excellent you know just how do we you know pull these resources together in a in a in a way that makes sense and benefits not only our community but the region thanks very much kevin okay council um Councillor Page, uh, we're supposed to jump up to the top left-hand corner of the screen. I don't see anybody jumping up there yet. So, uh, Gabriel, have we any... any uh, Councillor Page. Councillor Page. <clears throat> well, can I let Janice go first? I'm going to have a very similar set of questions anyway. So okay, so I see Janice, up. Uh, you're up. Councillor Morrison. Hey, are, you, are you asking all the same questions again, Councillor Page? So I have a few questions and maybe somewhere I've kind of maybe missed a meeting along the way. So a few things is that um, uh, congratulations for your new job, uh, Melanie, coming from CAST. One of the things that I have uh, noted since uh, the Nelson Innovation Center has started is that there has been this um, struggle for leadership and ideas and there's been a lot of big asks of money coming to the city and and uh, um, you know we have we have many projects within the city that we have to to fund and and initially I was told that that NIC was going to need you know twenty five thousand dollars for startup money and then they'd be good to go after that and every year they've been back at the table and it's not just been asking for twenty five but sometimes you know forty sometimes fifty and and you're asking now today of sixty. Um, my can I have some concerns just about I'm trying to figure out here in terms of now all of a sudden this leap from um, from tech of which um, I will just admit I know very little about tech and tech entrepreneurship um, to now climate change and I and I realize that having a climate innovation hub sounds like a marvelous idea um, but I have some concerns around um, if we're going to be in your space then that um, my guess limits your ability to rent space um, uh, down at the at the NIC. Um, the other question would be: Is then are we then paying? Are we going to become uh, lease? Are we going to be renting from you for the space that we're using as the city? Um, and then in terms of staffing, um, are we staffing this with with our city staff, or are we hiring? Or are you hiring uh, staff to deliver? Um, our city um, program. I guess what it comes down to for me is a little bit of um, Nelson Next uh, is the is a city plan, and as I look at this, it, it looks to me like suddenly we've given our plan off to the private sector to um, implement. And and if that's the case, and I'm wondering how we as the city still continue to have um, control over the delivery of our public. Um, plan. So that's a that's a that's a lot of questions. Um, maybe you can try picking off a few for. So I, maybe I'll start. I think a lot of those are are really the the city's um, questions to the city. Um, you know, Melanie is part of a partnership uh, that we developed to deliver our programs or, or collaborate with our programs. So. Uh, so the first piece on, you know, we were looking for how do we, as uh, Cecilia talked about, how do we become public facing? Uh, how do we um, bring community together? Um, how do we get value for the contribution that we're, we're um, providing um, or that we're, you know, the city's providing to the NIC? And I, I think it's important to differentiate tasks with NIC. So the NIC is not um, cast um, space or building, or it's they're the delivery uh, partner for programming uh, out of the NIC. So I would characterize that as actually the city's space and, and the community space. And like I said, cast is the is the delivery agent for the you know the clean tech um, in the technology piece of it. Um, so that's. I think it, it's important to differentiate. Uh, it's it's not you know this was the it was built, um, developed by the Economic Development Partnership and um, CAST uh, stepped up to 
be the operator of this, this space. And I don't think that relationship has changed in that, that regard. So, so that's, you know, we're really, I know council struggled a bit last year. Are we getting true value out of this by just, um, you know, just on the economic development front? So we look for opportunities of how do we provide direct value to the city? And, and this is when we're talking to our, our climate team, you know, there was a real opportunity to provide a uh, direct, um, you know, benefit to the city uh, uh, with that. As far as delivery of our climate action plan, that's, you know, again, the, the you know, the, the responsibility of the city as a whole and, and the climate team in particular. Uh, so no, uh, we're not asking CAS to, um, or the private sector to deliver the climate action plan. Uh, certainly they're all part of it and need to be part of it as is the rest of the community. But no, they wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be their staff, it'd be our staff that would, you know, deliver a lot of that program. And I'll, I'll let, uh, maybe Cecilia, do you wanna, you know, yeah, I would love to add to that. Um, I uh, agree and echo what you're saying there, Kevin, that this is not about handing off the plan um, to CAST or the Nelson Innovation Center. We see this as a way of elevating the programming that we're currently delivering it and just using it as a tool to really drive up participation in our climate action programs by making us more competitive in our grant application, by inviting the community in to have a public space where they can actually talk to somebody who is a representative of this program that might be able to answer some of the questions that are currently the barriers of either them retrofitting their home or not retrofitting them home. And of course, we know that we have engagement work around all of the city's climate action programs. So not just the ones that are administered by our teams, but also our fire smart programs and these sorts of things um, that make a lot of sense for them to have that really um, well-equipped engagement space for them. And so it makes a lot of sense for our team because this is a place that already is, you know, starting to become more well-known in the community as a great hub for technology and because of the overlaps with the clean technology sector and our climate action goals, we just see this as a really beneficial and harmonious relationship for us. So I hope that answers some of your question, Councillor Morrison. I'd like to say a few words as well on that. Um, so I guess one aspect that I would like to get across too is that I see CAST as having its own strategic pillars and that the NIC is one program that we deliver, or I guess not deliver, but that we manage and that we're looking for that impact from that space. So we will continue to utilize the space for tech meetups and, and as it was originally planned, but I, it's not being utilized enough right now, definitely not enough. It's empty behind me. So I would love to see events happening and people coming and going and how that brings awareness to um, the climate innovation programs and events it's equally going to bring people in the door to benefit from our other cast programming. So I do see this as this really um, this ingenious collaboration between us all that everyone's getting a benefit out of it. And what you mentioned about the rental space, it's not, we're not losing space from our tenants. So that's, it's going to be more in the, the lobby area, I guess, behind us that we can open that up for more drop-in experts. So we're not losing any funding that way and we're still going to be able to hold events. So it's not really changing that aspect. Um, and about the funding act as well, I wanted to mention, so I would know you said that every year we're coming back for more and more. So obviously we don't want that to be, that to be the case forever, um, but we're not in a situation right now where we can run this or manage this space um, really having that impact, which I think needs a coordinator, someone to dedicate a lot more time to um, and have that sustainable yet. So what I really want to see is that this next year, we ramp things up. We get events going, we get this as a bouncing hub of activity so that the following years we can start to ask for event fees or um, higher memberships or ways to make this a more sustainable uh, long-term plan. I just want to clarify on the the ask um, council approved the forty thousand last year. Uh, what Melanie is suggesting is um, that we don't pay that full forty thousand. 
uh, because you know the programs weren't delivered last year. So really, uh, forty thousand has already been funded. You know the actual ask impact this year is another twenty thousand. It's not a sixty thousand ask. There's already forty thousand that's been committed uh, in twenty twenty one. So really, the only financial impact for twenty twenty two would be another twenty thousand. Anybody else? Any further questions from council? Councilor Charwood. If we're on the same line. Councilor uh, Page and Councilor Charwood. <clears throat> I almost want to give my time to Nicole if she wants to keep down this. Okay. So I've, I've listened to, to everything you lovely ladies have had to, to say about uh, the Climate Innovation Lab and uh, all the aspirational goals of bringing the plan to life and along the lines of what I was asking the other nonprofits that were working in this space is I think in order to be successful here, it's there's going to be, we obviously have some major challenges ahead for ourselves as part of, as members of our global community, uh, tackling the challenge before us. And I really want to take out that innovation piece, that science and technology piece and ask um, how, uh, in order to be successful in that space, I think it's super important that the partnerships that we're building are with uh, organizations that are strong, that are capable of innovating, capable of problem identification, and capable of, of really putting the grind to the stone uh, to butcher our metaphor. So how is CAST uh, recruiting membership to build its organization? Uh, how is it going about selecting and electing its board and how is it bringing accountability and life to its strategic plan this was obviously for you melanie uh, i was prepared for these because you've already asked them <laughs> so for our membership um and i kind of i'm separating this a bit right now too because we have our cast members um and that is more of our entrepreneurial scene and then we we have some nic members that are more locals looking to use the space so We've got this broad range and what I'm looking is that in this next year, we're bringing in more of the public, the general public, everyone who wants to learn about climate innovation or challenges that we're facing and how we're going to solve them. So I think it's opening up our membership a lot larger, which is going to help across all of our programming. And to that note, we are still, we're revamping our membership model and how that, how that fee is associated with what the value is. Um, definitely something we're still working on at the moment. Um, I've had too many, too many things on the plate in the last couple of months. So um, in terms of board development, so um, we do have a skills matrix so that we are aware of what our board members currently bring to the table and what we are lacking and, um, and make sure that we do have that diversity on the team. So, and I did want to mention, while I've only been on for four months, the board has been absolutely incredibly supportive. They are chatting with me every step of the way to make sure I feel supportive and that supported and that we we're moving forward in a in a I guess a very very strong manner. So right now they've been more of a working board over the last year because of all the staff changeover. But we're very quickly moving to that strong governance model where we've got assigned committees and meetings, and I feel like it's a very strong path forward for bringing in new board members, um, onboarding them, and continuing that process. In terms of keeping track of our strategic uh, priorities, so I've got the cast board for our cast strategic pillars, and that's something that we're currently working on for the next five years of planning. Um, but I also want to put forward, I would love to have an NIC advisory committee. And what I envision this as um, is, I guess, consisting of Community Futures, um, the Chamber of Commerce, City of Nelson, and CAST, and that we get together on some, I guess, maybe quarterly, and just make sure that the NIC is still aligning to the goals that we want it to, um, and making sure that we are prioritizing our impact on the community as well. Supplemental, Councillor Page. Yes, please, Chair. Um, this is a bit of a gray zone for me, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. So I really want to press on the the issue: is is how who are the members of CAST itself? 
how do people become the members of CAS itself, and how does the board go about being selected by its membership? So right now, the board is actually not, um, it's not voted on by the members. So um, that's, I guess, a bit of a difference. Our, our members are really broadly, they're all over the place. They're across the Kootenays, but we also have some from Vancouver. Um, and what we're looking at in this membership model as well is our space here at the NIC, it's not a co-working space in a traditional sense. There's not desks that you can rent for a month and leave your belongings. It's more of a drop-in space. And so we're also targeting some of those tourists or out-of-towners who are um, skiing at the mountain and then they have a meeting in the afternoon and they need Wi-Fi in a boardroom. And they can pop in here um, buy a membership and belong to CAST as well in a way. Sorry to belabor the point, but if I may, Chair. Um, yeah. So, I, I, I guess I, I really wish we, we kind of had uh, some members of the board here tonight, but how does how is the board kept accountable to reach its strategic priorities if it doesn't go through a, through uh, a vetting by its membership? I guess that's a good question. Um, that's not how they have been running in the past. And um, I would have to touch base with them if we ever intend to go to more of a membership um, voting model. I don't know if that was that's in the goals or not, to be honest, right now. So. Okay. They're more just keeping me accountable. So. <laughs> I, I recognize we don't have any board members here, so I just there. I needed some clarity. I got some. Melanie, thank you so much. I know those were tough questions. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Torwood. Did you have a question? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Yep. Um, maybe a little bit more of a comment, but nice to meet you, Melanie and uh, Julia and Emily. Thanks for the presentation. Um, to hear that we had um, budgeted 40k already, that that's essentially still on the table. That's great news, I think, for this plan. I really like it. What I like about it and see that extra 20 as a, a relatively inexpensive investment. Um, <clears throat> myself and other councillors have raised that we were kind of surprised to see how uh, little the climate team was asking for in the budget. And this is an opportunity to, to, to be expanding it beyond uh, what we're doing just within the city proper. And I really appreciate the effort that's gone into this creative solution too. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanna reiterate what I heard, that this is gonna help us uh, diversify uh, funding for the city, that that's, um, uh, that we are going to have uh, uh, an uplift in our ability to communicate and do outreach with our community. Um, and I also heard, of course, that it's going to help us meet uh, our really ambitious climate targets. So I see that extra 20 grand as, as quite a, an inexpensive ask. Thank you very much. I just want to um, also, you know, Neil didn't really talk about this, um, but part of his um grant request is would bring money into the the center uh, substantial money into the center and and um and the intent is you know they're quite willing to work with with um our team and and cast and how that's delivered is it another person is it cast delivering that is it so there's a number of options there and you know I'm, you know so there's already a and basically, in his funding request, our contribution to the NIC is what he's leveraging for us. So, so he's he's going to leverage that money through a uh, fourfold, uh, the forty thousand um, through a fourfold to bring more money into the innovation center, give us more capacity. So, you know, I think that's part of the solution. You know, we need to leverage you know the funding that the city is putting directly into whether it's um you know growing the tech sector or you know the, the climate side of it if we can't leverage that then we're gonna struggle with this and and um you know this this first collaboration is a real opportunity uh to do that thanks kevin uh, any further questions or comments? I don't know if Neil is still on the line or not. Are you still there, Neil? He's gone. Okay. 
Um, okay, well, thanks very much, everybody. That was excellent. And uh, I think uh, it's too bad that Neil left because uh, Councillor Lochtenberg and I had a, had a call with him. And I have to say, I had to leave the call a little bit early, but I was really impressed with uh, the, the potential opportunity linking up with some of the work that he's doing, and in particular for rural British Columbia, and we're in that category. And, you know, I think we're well positioned to potentially uh, leverage a fair bit of um, funding going forward, not only from, uh, you know, uh, from the province and from the feds to uh, continue to support our endeavors. And the partnership is probably one of the ways that both groups can actually benefit uh, going forward. And, you know, Councillor Page has some good questions for you, Melanie. And um, I think there's some things there that you need to probably tidy up on uh, going forward, you know, to strengthen up your board, how your board operates and what their strategic plan is like, and, you know, how the governance model, model is working, etc. Because uh, I think that's probably been part of the challenge that... Uh, the cast has had in the past is was it wasn't really solidified well enough to sort of stand on its own two feet and um, I think there's some opportunity here for us all to work together and in particular to give us a front door for some of the climate initiatives that we're working on to be able to get the community engaged more so in what we're doing as well as leverage uh, potentially some uh, substantial funding to push forward some of our ideas and suggestions around climate action and uh, reducing our carbon footprint. So, um, Emily and Melanie and Cecilia, thank you very much for coming tonight and talking with us. And we look forward to sitting down with you and sort of dotting the I's and crossing the T's as we go forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Up next. Tom Thompson. The Nelson Chamber and Visitor Information Center. Okay. Yeah, I've got um, Val Yoak with us as well, the Visitor Center Manager, but she may be having some computer problems. Are you able to hear us, Val? Uh, yes, I am. This what I'll be joining you one second. Okay. Well, we'll just get rolling along here. This is a uh, visitor center presentation late in the evening. Uh, we're now past nine o'clock and uh, we're happy to be with you here, folks, tonight. Uh, thanks very much for giving us an opportunity to uh, come and speak to the city council as we have done on an annual basis for many years. And uh, the good news is, is this isn't the only presentation that I'm going to be doing tonight. I'm going to be joining Andrea Wilkie shortly thereafter. We'll let Val do some of this with us as well, just so that you don't get overly overwhelmed with uh, Tom Thompson. So, you know, it's really been a long and strange and also a second year for the tourism industry in Nelson and area all around uh, the province, all around British Columbia and Canada, the world. It's been not a, not a great year for tourism. Businesses and communities all around the world really struggled for the past 23, 24 months just trying to stay solvent and trying to keep their community safe. And it's been a delicate balance for a lot of those folks between safety and bankruptcy for many sectors. And during the course of this last year, just when we thought we were making some progress with COVID, we started getting more and more restrictions. As you guys all know, uh, we were cruising along. This thing seemed to be doing all right. And we had some uh, some travel, essential travel orders, and please wear face masks, and new public health orders and directions for uh, all of British Columbia. Sorry, we're closed. We can't come. We no no business right now. And that's that's not just a small a couple of sectors. That was certainly very impactful for the tourism sector, and for the uh, the arts and culture sector as well, as we've heard in some of the other presentations. You know, and tourism really matters to our local economy. We all know that it's uh, it's not the only driver of our economy, but it's certainly uh, a very important one. And it doesn't take a backseat to COVID. Uh, Tourism-focused businesses in Nelson and area really employ thousands of people. They put millions of dollars back into the local economy on a, on a regular basis. And we generate uh, lots of tax dollars locally, regionally, provincially, and nationally as well. So during the course of the last two years, there was kind of a slow 
ascend into challenges. And we never really got out of those. We had some peaks, we had a few valleys, but we never really got out of all of the, uh, the COVID related issues. And, and that's unfortunate because more and more people would love to have come to this area, but because of the restrictions, whether they be travel restrictions or border restrictions, it just made it much more challenging. And, and that was evident in our numbers, but it was also evident in local, uh, local numbers with, when you talk to small businesses. So we really had a spike in the summertime in the West Kootenai. There were some challenges here. We were trying to get our vaccination numbers up. Uh, we weren't able to do uh, quite as quickly as many other communities were able to uh, get their community vaccinated, but we continued to work hard and try to get the businesses and keep them solvent and, and keep them open for business. And there are certain restrictions that you just can't get past. And when COVID numbers start to spike, as we're seeing right now, again, with the Omicron virus, uh, challenges just continue to, uh, to take place. We did uh, actually, we were able to, in 2020, when the pandemic first hit, we became sort of a business outreach service for uh, a lot of, a lot of the time during the course of the season. Uh, visitors weren't, we weren't even open for the first two months of the pandemic, and then we were able to come in slowly. And our staff, Val and Denise, and uh, some of our summer students as well, were really, really important in getting information out, knocking on doors, getting posters out, and uh, helping with our economic development initiatives that we were working on uh, with poster campaigns like the Wearing is Caring campaign and the Shot in the Arm campaign. We also were fortunate that we were able to get, uh, you know, Darren Davidson through the FCBC program. Uh, we were able to get Darren involved in some of this as well. So he was doing business supports and we were putting together collateral material and assisting with that. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that during economic development, but the visitor center staff, they really turned their attention to business supports as much as possible. And when the wildfires were happening here, man, there was a lot of people call or around the province, a lot of people call Val and, and the staff there. And Val, you might wanna just talk a little bit about uh, some of the information that you guys give out during the course of some of those calls from whether it be floods or snowfalls or, or road conditions. Um, so when our visitors were calling uh, with regards to fires, floods um, that was going on this, this past year, um, we had to stay current on top of the ever-changing situations, um, be it where highways were closed, um, it, where the fires were. Uh, so we had to have that information ready for when visitors um, called. Visitors were also concerned whether they would be welcome to our area. They were concerned, would, would you welcome us if we were from Alberta? They had those concerns. So we wanted to ensure our visitors were welcome, um, but we had to stay current on what the latest protocols were, um, you know, what businesses were open, what their rules were. Um, things were ever changing. So we had to stay current to give the most up-to-date information to our visitors. During the course of the summer, uh, things were rolling along and then we wanted to make sure that we were getting more and more people vaccinated. So that's when we got out with this, you know, now that's what you call a shot in the arm campaign and, and Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism also did a, with the city of Nelson, the vax and relax kind of campaign. We needed to try to keep the businesses open for the fall. We were trying to think, well, we kind of thought, you know, the fall was going to get better and it was going to be a little bit better than it had been and, and things, well, you know what happened? Just when we thought things were getting better, it didn't improve nearly as much. So a lot about COVID. We don't want to talk about COVID all night long. We want to try to get past COVID as much as possible if we can. Uh, there's still some challenges, but you know we believe that this visitor center is uh, something that a lot of people really, really enjoy when they do come to our area. Um, you know, smartphone technology and websites, they provide access to a lot of information, but that face-to-face -face communication that Val and the staff provide uh, is tremendous. And Val, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the, uh, you know, just some of the great customer services provided. You know, blow your own horn a little bit here. Why not? <laughs> um, the key with customer service is listening and finding out what the visitor wants. And when we find out um, what their interests are, we strive to provide them the best possible experience. 
Uh, it's one of our goals is to learn as much about the area to provide new experiences for our visitors. Um, we want them to have a, a rewarding uh, a rewarding time while they're here uh, with, of course, safety in mind. Um, and then, which in turn leads to them spending more money and staying longer in our area. Um, we have a lot of fun. Our, our team goes out and learns as much about the business community, the recreational opportunities, restaurants, meals and entertainment. So we in turn, when we, we can speak to this when the visitors ask about all things great in Nelson and area. Yeah, and we really have an experienced staff. Val's been doing a visitor center manager job for a number of years. A great, great uh, person to be doing that job. Denise McInnes does a great job with us working in, uh, in the administrative side of the visitor center in the chamber. And we also have some, uh, a couple of summer students as well. And then just this fall after uh, Trina Walsh had left, we hired uh, Christy Holt and she's uh, fitting into our team as well. So. The summer students really are, they add a lot of, they add a lot of character, they add a lot of enthusiasm, and they give us an opportunity to get out and learn more about the businesses as we do fan tours, as Val talked about, and going out and finding out more about the hotels, what they offer, restaurants, uh, zip lines, golf courses, etc. So during the course of the year, Val, uh, we normally are around 23,000 walk-in visitors, and then several thousand more that uh, we wind up servicing uh, whether it's uh, through small, um, you know, have a tent down at a market or go downtown or even just the mobile services. But in 2021, uh, really the second year of COVID, the visitor center served just over 14,000. So you can see the decrease in the number of people that are coming to the community because of COVID. Uh, that became somewhat challenging. So uh, we did turn our attention to a lot of other things like we talked about previously. but. You know, it's not just people coming in. There's a lot of people that make phone calls, emails, um, certainly social media comments. Uh, these guys do a lot of time doing social media as well. So uh, very helpful for visitors, but we also help support the chamber and we also help support uh, things like Imagine Kootenai and Nelson and Kootenai Lake Tourism. When people inquire to Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism, a lot of times they're referred back over to our community. Well, maybe you could explain the graphs a little bit. We just talked some about that, but you might want to explain the graphs in a little more detail. So as we can see um, in 2021 and 2020, our visitor numbers dropped, which was due to COVID, lack of Europeans and US travelers. Um, and also people were afraid to come to, to our area, like, would we be welcome? Um, as you can see, the visitor origin uh, regional primarily is um, within our area, like West Kootenays, East Kootenays, that's what uh, defines regional, uh, BC visitors and Alberta. Um, so those who were the people we were seeing in 2021. And there's a lot of number of reasons why businesses were seeing a reduction in, in business. Uh, COVID protocols, less tourists, less locals, of course, Alberta and BC politics sometimes came into play when the, you know, British Columbia wasn't sure what they were telling Albertans and Albertans weren't getting all that happy about some of the messaging that was coming from our province. But uh, there were certainly some challenges and COVID seemed to be the biggest one and uh, travel restrictions. So if you look at the investment that the city of Nelson provides to our fee-for-service contract. The Chambers uh, operated the visitor center on a fee-for-service contract for a number of years. That's about $77,500. In the letter and the budget that we provided to you, it indicated that uh, we did receive a small bump uh, in 2019. So we thank you for that. Uh, it went up, I guess, inflationary. Uh, we had been at $77,000 for probably 10 or 12 years. So we hadn't gone up much, really, a, a, a good bargain at $34.29 per hour of operation. Uh, we were in operation uh, to the public for 20, over 2,200 hours, and our total annual operating expenses are about $191,000 uh, to operate the visitor center. And Val, uh, some of the things, maybe you can go through some of the things that we were able to provide in 2021 when we were open to the public. 
So um, not only is a visitor center, we, well, we offer local knowledge. Uh, we have an extensive um, variety of pamphlets, of local pamphlets and brochures on BC and area maps. We have an amazing gift shop uh, for souvenirs as well as for locals. Um, we also have featured artists. Uh, we throughout the Christmas um, season where we've had pop-up markets, artists come and display their goods. So that was exciting. Um, we offer um, uh, information through not just Aria Kootenays, the Kootenay Rockies and BC. We're open year round. We have washrooms, we have Wi-Fi, um, an amazing boardroom and um, we're Welcome to all questions. So during the course of uh, the year, net operating income was about $169,600 uh, for the visitor center. The operating expense is about 191000 And so there's an excess expenses over income of about $22,000. Last year, it was a lot lower than that. Most years, we're in the neighborhood of twenty-five dollars to $35,000, depending on what year it is and what kind of expenses we occur, incur. And that is traditionally just made up by the Chamber. So the Chamber of Commerce subsidizes the cost of the visitor center. Uh, the annual primary expenses include three full-time staff wages and benefits. There's two to three or 2.5 seasonal visitor center counselors, depending on the year. Uh, we have a pretty high municipal tax uh, chunk that comes out. Um, two years ago, we, the province reduced commercial taxes by about 50%, so that uh, dropped our expenses by about $8,000, but they're back up and flying at regular rates now, so that's uh, fairly considerable. Utilities are high for the building, and then building and property maintenance are uh, always, uh, always uh, quite expensive as well. And we don't charge the visitor center any, any rent. So it's a good thing that we don't charge them rent because if somebody else was going to be doing it, it would probably cost them even more to be operating a visitor center like this. And as Val mentioned, we feature artisans year round and we also had some uh, pop-up markets during the course of uh, this past year in uh, November and December just to, to play out the, the retail season around Christmas time. So there's a lot of things that uh, that we wind up doing. Thursday night socials, we hope to get back. We've been a great uh, area for many, many community events down here, bike races, uh, all sorts of different things. We're home to the tech-focused Nelson Innovation Center just down the, uh, the, the alley from us, and a visitor center that welcomes tourists and supports hundreds of local businesses. And not only would we like to thank you, but all of those businesses would like to thank you and all of the employees that work at those businesses. Uh, you know, we really tend to, to, to share the wealth around the entire region, not just the city of Nelson, but throughout the region. And I think Val and the staff down in the visitor center do an incredible job uh, supporting local businesses. And we thank the city for their ongoing support. Thank you. Now, if I can figure out how to... Uh, Get out of this particular presentation. Thanks, Val. Tom, thank you very much. And if we have any thank questions, uh, as soon as Tom gets this down off the screen, we'll see if there are any questions. Well, I'd be happy to if I could get back to it. Hand My apologies, folks. Yeah, no problem, Tom. Thank you engaged. very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lochtenberg had his hand up, I think. Did you? <clears throat> uh, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for that presentation, Tom. I think I've asked this question every year that I've sat on council. But looking at the income, um, you know, you have you receive funding, obviously, from the province of BC and from the city of Nelson. But I don't see any um, funding from the RDCK. Um, can you explain why not, since they clearly would benefit from a visitor center, certainly the you know, area E and F and G, 
um, and beyond, actually. Why are they not, why, why do they not contribute? Yeah, well, we, uh, uh, we approach the, from a chamber perspective anyway, we approach them uh, from time to time on uh, special, special events where we may need some funding, but we also go to them for economic development funding. So we feel as a chamber uh, that we can take funding from our members from that region and support the operation of the visitor center as opposed to going directly to uh, the chamber director or the uh, regional directors themselves. Thank you. Any that's other, a, any, oh, Councillor that's Page, a common theme. Councillor Page, that regional yeah. funding, regional funding is a common theme every presentation tonight. Yeah. Pretty well. Um, I think I see one hand up. I think that's, is that yours, Councillor Page? Yeah. Uh, it is a good, you know, Lautenberg has a, has a good point there. Uh, I, the, for, for the request that comes forward to us on top of the membership dues that are pulled from, like I certainly live in the city of Nelson and run a business in the city of Nelson and pay membership dues. Uh, from the city of Nelson, that's not much different than someone who might be out in Balfour. So, I think there's some there's a conversation for equity there. But of course, as we all know, we, that conversation is had often, and, and there is varying degrees of success with it and at varying tables. So, it's a good point. Uh, whether or not we can accomplish it in this round, I think we all know where where that goes. You have heard these questions earlier today, but I, I think. Um, I do keep seeing it in the community. I, I think there was a few issues that went through the year uh, that you might recall, and I won't touch on on any of them, where there's just a, a kind of a, a lack of understanding or a lack of clarity from the community as to who your membership might be, uh, how you guys go about, you know, selecting your board and how you guys keep your board accountable to its strategic priorities. And I guess the fourth kind of question on that is, what what do you see as some of your highlight priorities for 2022? The visitor center or for the chamber of commerce? For the chamber, just as the organization uh, delivering this programming, how do you? Who are your members? Where do you recruit them from? Uh, and how does you? How do you go about building your board? And how do you? How does your board keep itself accountable to the strategic priorities it sets? I think that's an interesting question because we're. Chamber of Commerce that has a fee for service contract to run a visitor center, but that's clearly only a small component of what we do during the course of the year. Uh, so I'm not sure how we take the visitor center and turn it into a Chamber of Commerce specifically, how the board operates, but the, the board is, is a diverse board. Uh, we have representation from all sectors including uh, people that are not in the tourism business. We also do a, a strategic planning se session uh, two year, every two years, and we've, that the board lays out the goals and strategic objectives for the organization as a whole. Uh, the visitor center is a component of all of those goals and objectives. So we want to continue to operate a visitor center uh, as we do for the city of Nelson. So the city of Nelson has a fee for service contract with us. Uh, we didn't go to the city of Nelson and say we would like to operate a visitor center. We think it's beneficial to the community. We think we do a good job of running the visitor center. Uh, we think we are highly efficient at running it and very fiscally responsible. And, uh, you know, if somebody else was looking at running a visitor center, um, I'd say we've got a great location for it and they can come down and talk. And how do you guys reach out and find new members? How do you bring people into the fold? Uh, because th that's where a lot of the funding is coming through. That is filling up the other side of the uh, of the operational budget on the visitor center, and it's also driving a lot of what kind of services are being offered. I I have here one of your funding packages that has gone through uh, as part of the COVID stuff. So I, I am interested, and I think the community is interested in how the membership is built. Uh, that supports this organization and these these services being delivered. I think you know since our our, our membership is about five hundred 
20 or thereabouts uh, members and non-profits uh, throughout Nelson and region. There's a couple from outside of the area. Uh, we go out, we knock on doors, we super serve people, we provide them with COVID supports, we provide them with business supports, we provide them with the advocacy uh, issues when they've got a problem. We work with all levels of government, whether that be uh, the local municipality or the regional district or the provincial or the federal government. I think that our advocacy efforts are what wins a lot of chamber members over. They feel that we do a good job for them. And as long as we do a good job for them, I think that they'll continue to be members. So we ask our members, what is it you need? And then we try to deliver that to the best of our ability. So our goal right now, we've got a person that's uh, as a business recovery advisor, Darren Davidson. We got some funding through FCBC. And uh, his goal is to try to generate non-chamber members to become chamber members. So if you've got, you know, I think we're, as far as the Chamber of Commerce goes, in a community of 12,000 in a region of about 22,000 uh, with 550 members, we would could be considered a strong Chamber of Commerce. We're certainly the biggest one in the, in the Kootenai region, and uh, we're probably comparable to some of the ones in the Okanagan and elsewhere around the province in much larger communities. And we try to be as inclusive as possible by keeping our rates as low as, as low as we can, as opposed to asking for a large amount of money from a larger employer. Uh, we want to be as equitable as possible. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much, uh, Tom, Val. Good to see you. Uh, I think you're sticking you. around, Tom, are you? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think... Uh, Sorry, I think I, I think see Andrew the Councillor Edmonds. Join us here Councillor Renwick, did you have your hand up? No, thank you, Mayor. I was just waving goodbye. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Are you leaving? <laughs> no, Val's leaving. I thought you were nodding oh. up there. <laughs> okay, and up next is, uh, I think, Andrea, you've got the floor. You, you, I think Tom's going to be tag-teaming with you a bit. And I see your presentation. Thank you, Mayor Dooley. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, great. Uh, Tom, I'll pass it over to you to get us started. Okay, are you uh, are you controlling the slides, Andrea? Yeah, I will drive. Oh, you know what? Bus. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so we've got another uh, 10 or 15 minutes here for you folks, and uh, we're going to talk about the Nelson and Area Economic Development Partnership, or the NAEDP. I'll talk a bit about uh, economic recovery outcomes for 2021 and the economic development strategic uh, priorities for 2022 and a funding renewal request. So as you all know, uh, for those of you that have been on the council table for a while, that the we're kind of an innovative economic development partnership. It was created back in 2005 to pursue economic development opportunities in and around Nelson and area jointly, efficiently, and effectively. And our partners include the City of Nelson, the RDCK, Area E and F, uh, Nelson and <coughs> District Chamber of Commerce, and of course, uh, Community Futures of Central Kootenai. During the course of uh, this past year, one of the things that we really focus on is business retention and expansion, uh, COVID-19 workforce and consumer safety support. So you'll see some of the things that we talked about in the previous campaign that were supported by the visitor center staff. Uh, wearing this caring campaign, now that's a shot in the arm. Uh, Fax and relax and keep us open for business. Some of those uh, campaigns, the wearing is caring, you still see the signs up. There's about 375 of those that have been distributed around our, our area, uh, now that's what you call a shot in the arm. Not quite as successful, but about 125 of those got put out. And the Keep Us Open for Business, you can they started as red and green, and they're now orange. They've been up so long in some of those locations. So people were clearly supportive of, of the Keep Us Open for Business campaign. And we also had a number of uh, things like the BC Marketplace, which is small business BC's marketplace and we've got about 475 Kootenai area businesses on there and of that approximately 300 uh, chamber and uh, Nelson Kootenai Lake tourism businesses have been uh, entered onto the marketplace as well. Thanks Tom. And the other thing I'll touch on is that 
Um, a goal here was to drive uptake of workforce supports by Nelson and area businesses. So to support that, we created a list of workforce supports um, by talking to KCDS, talking to the base and business advisors, finding out what supports were of most value to businesses, and then we listed them on the Community Futures website. And then we did a mail out to over 200 businesses in Nelson and area to encourage people to go to the website and to look at options for workforce supports. So another area we focused on in the past year around business retention and expansion was driving technology adoption for traditional businesses and also investment and workforce attraction. So the goal here was to drive uptake of the existing programs to support tech adoption. Um, and so the way we promoted this is we utilized uh, Darren Davidson to do outreach to businesses, as well as Jenna Annette, who was our community economic development intern. Um, and we also promoted them through e-newsletters and social media. Um, so some of the programs we, we promoted were the Selkirk, the Selkirk College COVID Rapid Response Team, where we had a team of student interns that worked with 44 Nelson and area businesses for free um, and helped them do things like set up their Google My Business profile, set up websites, and improve their social media presence. We also drove traffic to CAS DER3 program, which Melanie talked about earlier. Um, so we had over 100 Nelson businesses participate in that. And then when that program ended, the BBA program picked that up, the Basin Business Advisors program, by offering uh, free tech reviews. And so both of those programs provided businesses with access to a, a technology expert that could help them with things like their digital marketing, their e-commerce, um, working remotely, uh, and give them advice on how to go about that. Um, and then from an investment attraction perspective, we continue to be part of the Imagine Kootenai Partnership. Um, which goal is to attract investment and a workforce to the region. So over last year, we had about 150 investment inquiries, about 31 businesses listed for sale and two that were sold. And we also had over a thousand click-throughs um, for job searches in Nelson and area. Another angle we take from business retention and expansion perspective to support workforce is we are part of the rural and northern immigration pilot. Um, and so the goal of that program is to attract and retain skilled workers to our region. Um, it's a community-led immigration program designed to bring skilled permanent residents to rural communities. And the goal of the program is to spread the benefits of economic immigration to communities outside of large, large urban centers. Uh, so since spring 2020, we've recommended 83 candidates from Nelson and area. 22 candidates and their families have received permanent residency and continue to live and work in Nelson. And the types of positions that we're seeing being filled through this program are care aides, carpenters, welders, um, as well as some management position in food and beverage. We're also part of the provincial nominee program. And so this is another program that allows us to attract investment to our region. Um, it's an entrepreneur immigration pathway, which requires entrepreneurs to purchase businesses. So Tom's the point of contact for this program and responded to 38 inquiries this past year with three candidates moving forward to um, submitting formal applications. And then our third goal uh, in 2021 around economic recovery was to see the creation of more workforce housing. So we were happy to see 129 housing user, units come online with the opening of Hall Street Place, Heritage Place, and uh, Lakeside Place being in development through the efforts of Nelson Cares, Share Nelson, and working with the city of Nelson. So sector development is really, really important. We uh, quite often have sector consultations through the chamber over the years, and then we've been working with economic development to, to get those a bit more <coughs> focused as well, depending on which sector needs the support as, pos as much as possible. So some of the things that we really worked on in this last year would have been uh, the, the food and beverage sector for sure. So we hosted a, a session, talked about what can we do to assist? How can we help you? What kind of advocacy in, uh, do you need? And that was really, really important. And then in September, we hosted another virtual roundtable with food and beverage sector, uh, retail sector folks as well, and to see what they were thinking when it came to patios and temporary patios, and then worked with uh, Sebastian and the administration to make sure that uh, council was up to speed on some of those issues. And 
thank you for extending the temporary patio situation for the upcoming year. Um, retention of the arts and cultural sec center is, is really, really important as well. Uh, there was a completion of the arts, culture, and heritage study. Uh, that study provides an understanding of the sector, the economic conditions, and the impacts of COVID-19. And the presentation with findings is planned for the city in February. So we're looking forward to being able to present that. And Andrea and the Arts Council and the, and the cultural development folks were really, really, uh, really important in doing that, as well as Selkirk College. Then growing the technology sector and some of the sector support there is, is something that's still important to us. So supporting traction on demand to meet their workforce needs through a $119,000 grant. Um, and also Tech and Knowledge Workers Facebook group with about uh, almost 1,600 members. So advocacy is something else that uh, we seem to uh, get ourselves deeply involved with. It's a lot through the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Partnership has been doing uh, much more of that as well. So the BC Chamber advocates uh, with businesses on an ongoing basis with the provincial government and also the Canadian Chamber of Commerce uh, does a good job of taking our issues to the uh, federal government and, and getting those COVID supports that were, uh, were needed during the course of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we've had uh, regional COVID restrictions, a lot of BC Chamber of Commerce advocacy on that, transportation. Uh, we had uh, policy regarding uh, uh, Kootenai transportation with the BC Chamber of Commerce and also we launched a KootenaiShipping.com website um, and the social development and poverty reduction we've also been actively involved with. And then communications, we've been trying to step up our communications and get that uh, you know, top of mind in most people's, uh, most people's awareness. Uh, we've always had a challenge getting, we know that we do a good job and making sure that everybody else is aware that we're doing a good job. So we've come up with some metrics and a report card that we've uh, done up to our economic development partnership on a quarterly basis. And it's really helped us uh, come up with the three pillars of business retention and expansion, workforce housing, and sector development. And if you haven't seen the uh, report card, there's a small report card there, but we'd be happy to send that out to you as well. And then uh, just leveraging funds. I think we've done a pretty good job of trying to leverage the money that we receive from the Economic Development Partnership. Uh, the Chamber was successful in getting $50,000 from FTBC to cover the cost of Darren Davidson's uh, business recovery advisory work. Um, there was some $30,000 from my tax, which is uh, Selkirk student research intern, Jenna Annette, and uh, Community Features did a great job of getting that. There was 87,000 from the provincial government uh, technology business training fundamentals for 11 students and there was another forty thousand dollars we received from the bc chamber of commerce through western diversification and we did a uh, think local first campaign that was run before christmas and we'll also have some uh, legacy pieces that will be able to run throughout the first half of 2022 as part of that thanks tom <clears throat> so that was a bit of a summary of what was achieved in terms of ec economic recovery goals in 2021 um, we also, in October, hosted a strategic planning session um, to talk about 2022 and what our goals should be for 2022. So we did this by engaging 22 participants, which included representation from forestry, technology, food retail, which is an essential service, and some of the hardest hit sectors like tourism, arts and culture, the ski industry, and food and beverage, and as well as our NAEDB partners. So we asked participants to respond to the question, what are the most pressing challenges or greatest opportunities that the NAEDP should focus its efforts on in the upcoming year? And it was from that discussion that we identified the following strategic priorities for the upcoming year. So with the first one being workforce shortages, um, as a result of people being out of work due to COVID or looking for a career change as a result of the time they took off during COVID, um, and as well as the demographic shift that we've seen coming for a long time, um, the workforce shortage is upon us now, and I think we're all seeing that by um, looking around at our local businesses and seeing shorter hours or days that those businesses are closed. <laughs> so our goal here in the upcoming year will be to focus on the hardest hit sectors and engage them to better understand their workforce shortages and to come up with solutions that the NAEDP can help tackle. 
Workforce housing, of course, is linked to workforce shortages. It's hard to retain and attract workforce when you have limited housing available, and that's especially true for uh, service industry employees. For this priority, we want to gather data on successful municipal housing initiatives, engage local stakeholders, and to determine where the NEP, NEDP can, can best support this priority. Uh, business retention, I'm going to go into more detail on the next slide, as that's one of the biggest focuses of the NEDP. And continuing to have a role around advocacy. So advocacy, advocating for economic recovery supports for our local businesses and examples of the types of things we do in that area is we're currently advocating for adjustments to the paid sick leave legislation uh, in light of the current impact of the uh, Omicron virus. So from a business retention and expansion perspective, you see the topics um, under that priority area that were identified. So with the fire season that we just had, We'll be looking to identify key anchor businesses that are a priority to retain in the case of an economic uh, interruption and work with them to get business continuity plans in place. Uh, we also want to continue um, helping businesses operate safely during COVID, whether that's developing ongoing communication tools and posters like Tom talked about, um, or pivoting to support needs as they come up, whether that be access to rapid test or advocating for policy change. As, as Tom mentioned, we just completed the arts and culture study. So we're looking forward to bringing forward the findings from that study and identifying uh, where the NAEDP can take action to address uh, some of the recommendations that come out of that. Supporting local, um, we'll continue to be promoting uh, shopping local and celebrating the fact that our locals have done an excellent job of supporting our local businesses. And I just came from a CF board meeting where one of our board members said that um, as somebody that creates a local craft food product, uh, she had one of her most successful years and she really um, has seen that locals are looking to support local businesses and especially um, over the holiday season. Investment attraction will continue to be a priority through the Imagine Kootenai Partnership and the Provincial Nominee Program. Uh, mental health supports, this is another theme we're hearing a lot about, uh, burnout in terms of entrepreneurs as well as their employees. So we'll be working to connect businesses with available mental health supports for themselves as well as their staff. And then finally, climate action. Um, so looking to work with partners like Melanie, Cecilia, who we just heard from, Carmen Proctor, to identify what are some small steps that businesses can take to support climate action um, and get that in front of them and make it top of mind for them. And I'm going to turn it to Tom to talk a little bit about what the BC Chamber of Commerce has heard from businesses recently in terms of where they're at in terms of their mindset around the upcoming year. Yeah, quickly, uh, the BC Chamber during the course of the pandemic uh, did a number of BC Mind Reader surveys uh, with businesses all around the province. And we were reporting back to you folks uh, previously on some of those findings. Then in the fall, there was a collective perspective uh, survey that was done. So how are we doing as we've gone so far through this pandemic? And it really showed that uh, there was about 1,300 businesses that took place. 82% reported being in good or acceptable shape. So that's actually pretty good. It's a decline from 94% in, in 2019, but uh, still compared to where it was uh, during the heart of the pandemic, not so bad. 76% are not back to pre-pandemic successes, which is a bit of a challenge. You know, you still got uh, ways to go before we get everybody back up there. And which level of government has the biggest impact on you? Well, we're talking to you right now. Uh, you guys, surprisingly, even though uh, the feds rolled out a bunch of dough and the province rolled out a number of programs, uh, the majority of businesses feel that the biggest impact uh, with government is local government, so local and regional government, municipal and regional government. So you've got a lot of weight to carry on your shoulders. Uh, businesses are expecting a lot, and uh, thank you for uh, you know all of the stuff that you've done over the past. But businesses certainly believe that uh, local government is is the most important. Paul, well, if I can add to that, it was interesting to hear it the when this data was presented that. Um, that local government has really um, come off well in the pandemic in terms of the support they provided to local businesses and the local business community really recognizes that. Um, so that was nice to hear.
So you want me to do this, Andrea? Sure. Okay, so uh, the contribution from the city of Nelson uh, has traditionally been uh, $80,000. A few years ago, it was at, uh, I believe it was at $100,000, and some of that money was, was taken back uh, to help some a program at, uh, at the city of Nelson. So it went to eighty. dollars uh, This particular contribution we've asked for $90,000. Uh, Area ENF contributed $40,000 to the partnership, and there was a carryover of uh, Ten thousand dollars from the previous period for a total of one hundred and forty thousand dollars. So, through the strategic uh, short uh, planning sessions, we've got uh, seventy five hundred allocated to workforce shortages, uh, seventy five hundred to workforce housing initiatives or studies, uh, business retention and expansion about sixteen five, and there's advocacy and communications, and then uh, you can see the rest of the project money here as well, totaling one hundred and forty thousand dollars. So. Um, we haven't really had an increase in a number of years. Inflationary increases would probably put us up to that $90,000 range, uh, considering it's been, well, I don't know how many years it's been, Andrea, but it's been a number. Uh, inflationary increases would be approximately $10,000, considering uh, where we're at. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom and Andrea. Okay. Any questions from Council? Any hands up there? Uh, Councillor Charlwood. Charlwood. I believe you had your hand up. Thank you, Mayor, I did. Uh, thanks for your presentation and for holding out to the end here, you guys. I know that's always a tough place to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I did go through all the new um, programming from uh, Imagine Kootenays to um, the shipping, new shipping information website. I see lots of, of things going on. Uh, and I understand your um, increased ask. Uh, but just looking at your financials uh, provided down the very bottom of the report that we got in advance, uh, you're expecting a 10 grand surplus. And so I, that's the amount you're asking us for. So I just wanted to ask uh, on that why you'd like that, essentially that 10 grand, if if we don't um, increase, then uh, you have a break even year. Can you uh, speak to that, please? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Great question, Councillor Charwood. Um, Community Futures manages the budget and we operate on a fiscal year starting on April 1st. Um, whereas the funding comes from the city on a calendar year. So we typically see a bit of a lag like this every time we come and ask for funding. We haven't actually wrapped up the year that we're operating in. So you'll typically, like I think every year we have somewhere between a ten and $20,000 carryover. And it's because we haven't finished the year um, that we're using that budget within. Okay, Councillor Charwood. Councillor Page. So, Andrea, obviously we helped shape some of the, uh, I've been at the table, we have t discussed a lot about the strategic priorities. And one of the, one of the actions that flow from that in 2022 uh, as I look at the work that was done with the cannabis sector, the discovery work in order of figuring out what our priorities need to be to develop the, the cannabis sector, and the business retention work that was done around art, arts and culture and understanding what, what needs need to be met there, and we're still uh, still starting to see what that work is going to be. Um, earlier, uh, through the presentations we've seen tonight, we uh, had discussions about uh, some of this work that was some of the work that's happened at the NADP led us to the NIC. Uh, we had coming out of the NA, NADP the tech and workforce coordinator role uh, as it looked to develop the technology workforce in our area. Uh, we have this idea within the community or within the city that we need to bring our Nelson Next plan and climate action work to life. We have a plan, we've laid it out, we have a delivery partner something that the NADP helped identify, helped create, helped find funding for, that gives us the opportunity to have a front door. A gap that I'm seeing 
uh, coming from the conversations tonight is that research and development piece, that sector development piece of climate action and climate innovation. And I wonder, and this hasn't really, really articulated around our table in the past or before, but I wonder how we can bring mo uh, many of the strategic priorities and actions that are already in our strategic plan together to, to look at the climate innovation as a sector itself and something that we need to develop uh, within our area, within this riding. Uh, and do we, is, does, is that something that we can tackle at the NADP or take to the NADP, NADP table to say, how can we develop an innovation sector uh, within the Nelson and district community? So Keith, if I, if I, I just wanna make sure I understand your, your I question know. correctly. So I think what you're asking is, um, over and above sharing with businesses strategies for them to take climate action. It's stepping back, bigger picture, like what are the climate action business opportunities and getting our local businesses thinking about them and innovating to create products or services that address that. Is that what you're asking about? Much like we would have done for the cannabis sector and much like we would have done retroactively to maintain what's going on in the arts and culture sector. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we haven't talked about that, but I think, um, I think with the partners we've got around the table, we're in the perfect space to do something like this, working with CAS, working with Nelson Next, um, getting people into the Nelson Innovation Center. I often talk about an event that uh, I think it was Innovate BC put on quite a few years ago at Selkirk College, you might have been there, um, where they had people come and present on business problems or opportunities. And then they had entrepreneurs in the room that were there to listen and hopefully go away and take those challenges or opportunities and act on them. And so I could see us doing something like that at the Nelson Innovation Center where we have people come and talking about opportunities for products and services that are relevant to climate action and getting entrepreneurs in the room, colliding, thinking about it, and hopefully going away and innovating and developing new um, new business ideas that come out of that. So I think that's something that with the people we have around the table, we could certainly do. And I yes, think Adam wanted to add to that. I'll add to that as well, Keith. We're actually, uh, we've got a meeting going tomorrow. We've got uh, a couple of folks that were taking part in the Nelson Nest Labs had approached us. So Rebecca Horning was in one of them and uh, Tom Murray was in another one. And they came to the chamber and said, we believe that you guys are the ones that should probably be the organization that tries to help, help us lead some of this. Uh, it'll be similar to a business recovery advisor. Um, so what Darren Davidson is doing, going door to door, here's some collateral material. We're going to work with the city. We're going to work with CAST. We're going to work with Community Futures. We're going to work with the Economic Development Partnership, making sure that we've got the same kind of collateral material that we take out to businesses right now, a little bit of information, a little background, some links. Uh, what do you need? What kind of stuff do you know? What do you need? How can we help? And we're not the experts, obviously, but we want to be able to uh, take as much information as we have. Uh, the chamber has allocated some of our money uh, towards this program. Uh, the, I think, well, we've got, I think the chamber's going to put five grand in, uh, the credit union is putting five grand in, and that'll get us started with some seed money. We want to get some basic background information about what a businesses need, what do they know already, and then three or four months from now, we'll take that and go to FCBC and say, is there an opportunity to carry this program on? So this is kind of a pilot that we'd like to do. The other one that CAST is doing is more focused, I think, on community education. We're going to try to focus a little bit on small business education. But we can't solve all the world's problems with $10,000. So we will do our best to get as much information out there as possible. And we look for people like you guys to be able to provide us with that information. And we've got uh, three representatives from the city are going to be at the meeting tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Anybody else? A question? Hearing none, Andrea and Tom, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, Thank so you we're at the tail end of the agenda here, and... Uh, Number eight is council reports. I'm not sure we have any tonight that I'm aware of. Um, late items, there are none. A resolution to adjourn.
Councillor Woodward and Councillor Lochtenberg. All in favour? Carried. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Kevin, Colin, and I'm not sure who else is still on there, but thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.